Good morning, Astronomy 1010, Summer 1, 2021. Uh, welcome to your first astronomy class with me, uh, Brendan Britton, your professor. Um, I'm going to go over some stuff with you today uh, about how this class works. We're actually going to do some work because it's a summer course. Um, I've got a whiteboard back here where I'm going to be taking notes. Can you guys see that okay? I find it's very helpful to write things down and for you guys to copy them into a notebook. That way you have a memory of what we talked about and it, hopefully it'll be a pretty good study guide too. Let me get my record out of here. Um, okay. Uh, hmm. Before we get into anything, before we talk about our class and stuff like that, let's start off by showing you guys a little slide and asking you a very important question. Can you guys see my screen okay? Yes. Okay. So here's what I want to know. Astronomy versus astrology. What's the difference between those two things? Do either of you guys, any of you three know? Um, in my experience, astronomy is like the study of the planets, the solar system, and everything to do with that. And astrology is the study of like the spirituality and ancient like religion or spirituality behind Astrology? Them. I actually took the like a class about that and I dropped out of the class. It's about like the study of the stars in astrology. Well, hold on, Joey. They both involve studying stars, but for different purposes. Oh, wait, oh, wait. Yeah. Like the positioning of the stars and the planets the affect the way of the Earth in astrology? Um, so in both branches, in both subjects, do you, you study the position of stars. Uh, but it's what you do with the positions of stars that's different. So what were you saying at the very end there? I kind of got lost. Oh, it, was it? I think it was about the stars and uh, <laughs> I know it's that. It's like how they, uh, all right. one second. Sure, it's okay. You can collect yourself. That's it, it's, uh, I think it's the way it affects around the earth, like the events that occur around the earth in the solar system. Mm, it's a little more nuanced than that. So Nina had the right flavor of the feeling when she said that astronomy was sort of the study of stars and planets themselves, and astrology had to do with this kind of mystical, spiritual stuff. The things that 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 I, I didn't like, Nina, is when you use the words religion, uh, because astrology is not a religion. Philosophers have dubbed it its own thing. Um... What about you, Whitney? Do you know the difference between those two things? I know you guys know about astrology because you talk to me about it when I'm out at the bar. You say, hey, yeah. what's your sign? Oh, yeah, that's that? like the zodiac sign and stuff, right? Yeah, zodiac signs. What are those zodiac signs? What are they all about? Oh, I'm a Pisces. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Let's you go must be a Scorpio. No, I'm just kidding. But um, <laughs> um, I think it's cool. Like I hear about, I didn't know the really the difference. I would have thought like, astronomy was like the study of like planets and space and all that stuff gravity um and astrology i feel like it's more like mythological mm, yeah uh, kind of sort of we're gonna let's talk about the difference let's figure out what's going on right here here's how i like to think about it guys um this is a picture of what your everyday astrologer looks like okay this is what astrologers look like okay and um the message of astrology goes like this everything's going to be great, you will be rich, okay? So that's the kind of stuff that astrologers say to you. Now, uh, on the other hand, here's a picture of what I think your everyday astronomer looks like. Um, this is a famous astronomer, Edwin Hubble. He discovered that the universe is expanding by studying the velocities of galaxies. Uh, astronomers have a different message for you, and it goes a little something like this. We're all going to die when the sun enters its red giant face. So right away, you can see that the message of astronomy is not quite as uplifting as the message of astrology. So that's the first important difference, okay? Let's talk about some other differences. You can read about both of these subjects in different magazines. Uh, for instance, you can read about astrology in your local supermarket magazine rack uh, you can read something like Dell Horoscope here, and there's all kinds of interesting things for you to discover, like how to balance mind, body, and spirit. Uranus moves into Pisces. There you go. Expect the unexpected, okay? 
Um, on the other hand, if you want to read about astronomy, well, the first thing is you're going to have to pay a little more money. This thing only costs a couple of bucks, but subscriptions to a magazine like Science or Nature, those run you in the hundreds of dollars because the information content is a little richer, all right? And there's a little more work that goes into something like this. This is a peer-reviewed journal. And um, in this magazine, scientists have to go out and they have to do things. They have to collect data with their telescopes and they have to do analysis and try to test hypotheses and, and, and take measurements. And, and before they can publish it in a magazine like this, they first have to write up a detailed description of what they did and submit it to a body of enemy professors who are out to get them, all right? And after the enemy professors anonymously read through it, inch by inch, looking for any possible flaw in the methodology, at the end, they say something like, well, the theory is misguided, but Jones's research is technically sound. And then you're allowed to publish in a magazine like this, okay? so. The threshold for publication, as we say, is a bit steeper in a magazine like Science than it is in, in something like Dell Horoscope. Uh, in fact, I'm not really sure what the threshold for publication is in a uh, astrology column that you would read in a, in, a, in a newspaper, like even the Providence Journal has an astrology column, right? And so what do you have to do to be the Providence Journal's astrology writer? I'd imagine that you show up to the editor's office with an energy crystal on your forehead and you say, bro, I've, I've been on dabs all day and I'm mad in touch with the stars, okay? And the editor says, I love it, 25 cents a word, your deadline's Monday. I'm betting that's probably the threshold for publication to write an astrology column. <clears throat> um, people get these things confused all the time, both because they have astro in the title and because they kind of at first seem to have the same uh, interest and scope. Here's what uh, Whitney was talking about a moment ago, your zodiac signs. Um, I know you guys know about these. You know about Pisces and you know about Scorpio because you just told me about them. I don't know if you know about the 13th zodiac sign. Ever heard of Ophiuchus? There's now a 13th what? zodiac sign. Yeah, some people, some people are Ophiuchus. We can talk about why this is. I need to write now, that down. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's magical. Um, what about, you know, these are real constellations, guys. These are real constellations in the nighttime sky that, that rise and set each day and night. Are there only 13 constellations or are there more than 13 constellations? What do you think? There's more. Yeah. I don't suppose you know how many. I, didn't, I wouldn't expect you to, but. I don't know how many. There are 88 constellations recognized by the International Astronomical Union. And in fact, in our labs, I guess we're gonna be doing a lab every class because this is one of those crazy summer courses. So in our lab on Wednesday, we're actually going to look at some of those constellations and identify famous stars and things. So the way it works is, uh, how do I put this? Well. Maybe I can show you with one of my little toys here. Hold on a second. On Wednesday, we'll take a look at this thing. This is a model called the celestial sphere, okay? And if you think about it, if you're standing on earth, you can look out into outer space in something like 360 degree directions. Now there's a whole lot of stars out there, but as far as you're concerned, if you're a little ant that just kind of moves around on the surface of this planet, you can only look in so many directions. And so the body of professional astronomers, the International Astronomical Union, they've sort of blocked out the sky into 88 constellations, which roughly correspond to the historical constellations that people have been looking at for thousands of years, like before science even existed. So I guess my question, what I want you guys to start thinking about is if there are 88 constellations in the nighttime sky to choose from, why do astrologers only care about 13? And furthermore, why are there only 13 personality types? That seems pretty limited for a planet that has billions of people on it, but I don't know, no one's asking me. Uh, <clears throat> 
Why does astrology only concern itself with 13 constellations? Do any of you know why? What I'm trying to figure out here is how much you guys know either about astronomy or month. There's only like 12, well, the 13. That's interesting, right? You're thinking, does it have something to do with 12 months? Um, not exactly. This is where we should learn something, okay? Let's take some notes. I wanna teach you guys the real difference between these people. And it's, it's kind of like what Nina said, but there's some thoughts. Okay. So let's do uh, astronomy on this side and astrology on this side. So first, sorry, this marker isn't particularly good. The first thing I wanna say as a, as a sort of note point is that astronomy is what we would consider a physical science or, and or, we could also consider it a, a natural science. And there are slight nuanced differences between these two things, which probably nobody cares about, but maybe I'll tell you anyways. You know, there's philosophers study what is science. Most people who do science don't have time to think too abstractly about what they're doing. They're just busy doing it. But philosophers then inform us about what it is we're up to. Physical sciences are things like physics and chemistry, and they kind of manipulate their environment and they put things into beakers and set them on fire. Natural sciences are ones where you kind of observe nature from a distance and you count and organize and sort things. So for instance, Charles Darwin on the HMS Beagle counting one, two, three, four, five Galapagos turtles, that would be a natural science. Physical sciences are where you, you build things and you squeeze them and you bend them. Astronomy has aspects of both. Traditionally, it was a natural science, but today, I don't know if y'all know, but we have rovers that are, you know, traversing the surface of Mars, and we shoot lasers into the rocks to analyze their chemical spectrum. That's very much like a physical science, right? Um, and I suppose if we had to define it, we could say it's the study of all kinds of things that happened when you look up, right? The study of stars. In our class, we're gonna focus on planets, moons, nebulae, galaxies. The Earth is a planet, so I guess we can study Earth too, and all the little people on it in some ways. And hell, even the bloody universe. Some astronomers spend their time worrying about the entire universe. So I guess if you study the universe, you kind of study everything in the universe, which is everything. That's pretty wild, right? That means astronomy has an infinite spiritual horizon, so to speak. Now let's talk about astrology. It's different. It's, it's neither a science, nor is it you know, a religion or a mythology, as someone else said. Let's start with the central premise of astrology. And this is why there are only uh, 13 zodiac signs. The premise of astrology is that the location of the sun, so the position of the sun against the background stars, Can you read that okay, Nina? It's a little small. Hey, uh, by the way, I just wanna make sure you guys know how to do this live Zoom thing. Uh, for all, by the way, anyone who's hiding in the background, I have a name for you. I call you trolls. So for all the trolls, yeah, don't troll me. <laughs> um, uh, if you don't know how to use this thing, oh, there's Nicole. All right, we have some people here today. Um, just in case you've never done this live Zoom thing before, there's a little button in the upper right-hand corner of your screen that says view, and you can toggle between gallery view and speaker view. When I'm taking notes, 
I toggle to speaker view and then I click on my face in the little boxes at the top. That way you can read this better. Did you, were you doing that, Nina? Um, I was just on gallery view, but I can, I changed it to speaker view. And now is it easier to take notes? Yes. So I guess it's a good thing we had that discussion, right? So Nicole and Joey, I hope you guys, you guys figured that thing out too, right? Okay, good. So the location, we're talking about what's, what's astrology? What's the central idea behind astrology? And it goes like this. The location of the sun against the background stars, and here's where it gets good. Here's where you start to realize what's on. On your B-Day, which is, of course, your birthday, the location of the sun against the background stars on your B-Day will determine your personality type and or your destiny. So the location of the sun against the bed, in fact, that might not even make sense to some of you guys. What the hell do I mean by that? Well, let me show you a little diagram to help you understand. You getting all that? You copied that down? Okay. Yep. Everything I write down, I want you guys to write down. That's important, okay? Um, let me show you a little picture here to help you all understand. I want you to look at slide 56 with me for a second. Obviously, you're on a planet called Earth and you're going around the sun. I don't know what you all know, but maybe you heard that before, okay? And as Earth goes around the sun, we can see the sun projected against different constellations in the background sky. Earth's orbit around the sun is pretty darn close to a circle. And that circle maintains its orientation in space. So year after year after year, we see the sun projected against roughly, this is a little bit of a lie, but I'm gonna start off by lying to you. So year after year, you can see the sun projected against the same sets of constellations. For instance, in March, the sun is located in Pisces. And uh, over here in June, the sun is located in Gemini. And in September, the sun's located in Virgo. Now, if you were a pesky student, I don't know if we have any pesky students this semester, but a pesky student might ask me a question. They might say, well, how do you know what constellation the sun is in? Because it's up during the day, you can't see any stars. I'd say, well, all right, that's a good point. But what you could do is you could wait for sunset. And just after the sun sets, you could sort of observe what constellation is there. And if you did that very carefully for an entire year, and humans have done this, they've carefully mapped out which constellations they see right near the sun just before it rises and sets. And over time, you start to even get a little smarter about it. You start to realize, okay, well, if I can see Virgo up at midnight, then that must mean the sun is in the constellation that's opposite Virgo, which is Pisces. Anyways, so you see, this is possible to do. You can keep track of what constellation the sun is in. The idea behind astrology is that the constellation that the sun is projected against is going to determine your personality type and your destiny. I don't know, they send magical vibrations through the cosmos that bop you off the head. So, you know, if you're uh, 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 an Aquarius, then you like, you know, water slides. And uh, if you're a Scorpio, then you like bugs and insects or something, you know? The difficulty with this statement is that this is not the kind of statement that we associate with something like a religion or with a mythology. Religions occupy a different domain than science. Science is concerned with, and I'd like you to write this down, science is concerned with the physical world. The physical world means things that you can taste and touch and measure, you can take a ruler and you can put it up to it. You can lick your Himalayan salt lamp or whatever you need to do. Whereas religions concern themselves with the metaphysical world and with questions of morals and ethics. You know, like if, is it, is it, is it a moral act for me to strangle my neighbor's dog if he barks all night while I'm trying to sleep? Is that something I should do? You might want to consult your local rabbi about that or something, right? 
The problem with astrology is that take a look at all the things they're talking about in their central premise, and you'll quickly realize that they are part of the physical world and therefore observable, measurable, and testable. For instance, the sun. The sun is a physical body that you can see in the sky. Hell, we even have this spaceship called the Parker Solar Probe, which we launched a couple of years ago, and it's currently en route to fly through the atmosphere of the sun. That means we're going to taste molecules and atoms in the atmosphere of the sun. It's certainly a physical body that you can study. The background stars are kind of hard to touch, but you can certainly capture light from them and analyze that light to find out what they're all about. Now your B-Day is kind of a historical fact. It's sort of on your driver's license. And then you get into things like personality types. Well, look, there is a noble science of psychology which attempts to measure personality types using various methods, you know. I guess in the past, it was the Miggs Breyer personality test. You ask people some questions, you know, do you like puppies or do you like kitties? Do you like popsicles or do you like ice cream cones? And then they would try to put you into a category like you're an alpha wolf or she's a beta fish or something like that. But, you know, I don't think they actually use that thing anymore. I think that's bogus, but there is a noble field of psychology which attempts to measure personality types. And then there's your destiny, which is like, okay, wait until you die and then find out what you did, all right? Did you do anything cool? Well, it turns out that there are lots of people who've gone out and carefully measured the position of the sun and the background stars and compared it to people's birthday and cross-checked it against their personality type. And they found out that this is a completely false statement. All right, so this is, and you should write this down, it's a false statement. It turns out that there is no relationship whatsoever between your B-Day and your personality type and the location of the sun against the background star. Okay, so sorry you're born on Albert Einstein's birthday. That'll make you Albert Einstein, okay? And even the, the, the most casual observer of human nature would quickly realize that there are way more than 13 personality types in this wide, wonderful world. Of course, they try to make it a little more interesting to compensate for that. They also, they got your moon sign and, you know, where's the planets and the seventh house of Sagittarius. It's all bullshit. None of it's true. And, and the philosophers who are confounded with this piece of nonsense then have to decide, what do we call this? Clearly, it has no spiritual value whatsoever, but it doesn't even like, like what they say about astrology is it, it, it doesn't uh, self, self uh, hold up to its own premises. Like it, it makes statements that are just clearly not true if you go and investigate them in a systematic way. So philosophers have dubbed astrology as a pseudoscience. A pseudoscience is something that uses technical jargon in the language of science, but actually does not hold up under self-scrutiny or have any of the things that it say need to have any relationship to the truth. So that's why I was a little hard on you earlier, Nina, when you were, I mean, you had the right idea. It's some hocus pocus, right? But, but it's a pseudoscience. That's what we call it. Now. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Let's talk. Would you argue that to some people it wouldn't be considered like a spiritual practice? Um, well, then those people would be spiritually lacking and unfulfilled in my opinion, because as far as I understand astrology, it, it's not like, like the, the Upanishads or, or, or there's some sacred Torah or texts that gives you morals and principles by which to live your life. Literally, if you look at these astrology, if you go and check your co-star, it says, mm, magical numbers are floating around today. I think you're going to meet someone at Stop and Shop. I mean, it literally says things like that, which that doesn't sound like a recipe for me or anyone I know to live their life. So I think for it to be spiritual, it would need to have some guidance about ethical or moral behaviors, right? And I, I just don't think they're there. I mean... I, I know that there's a bunch of different sects of astrology. Oh, you know what? I didn't even tell you the best part. 
you know what the funny thing is the, the most the most hilarious part about this astrology thing this is you know the chef's kiss here but it turns out that the moon exerts these gravitational torques on the earth um it, it's sort of a, a a weird effect of gravity in, in the moon's rotation and over a really long time over twenty six thousand years it causes the earth to kind of twist on its axis and it precesses like a top. And the reason I'm telling you about this 26,000 year precession of earth's axis tilt, maybe we can talk about that later, all right, is that by twisting the orientation of earth against the celestial sphere, it slowly drifts and shifts the position of the sun against the background stars, but really, really slowly so that it, people don't usually notice it. Most of the horoscopes that you read in CoStar or in a newspaper article or something like that, they're based on a 2,000-year-old book called Ptolemy's Tetrabiblos, where he, in the past, astrology and astronomy were a little more woven together because astronomy, let's think about this, astronomy is older than science, and astronomy is even older than mathematics. It's probably one of the most ancient systems of study there are. And in 500 AD, when, Ta when, when Ptolemy wrote Tetrabiblos, maybe, I'm sorry, maybe it was 50 AD. I might have my date wrong there. But thousands of years ago, when this book was written, the sun was actually in a different constellation on everyone's birthday, but no one bothered to update it. So for instance, if you, uh, I don't know, Whitney, you said you're a Pisces. What's your birthday? Sorry, you're muted, buddy. Sorry, February 27th. February 27th. There's a good chance that the sun no longer appears in Pisces on your birthday. Let's find out. Let's grab my celestial sphere. Let's be scientific about it. Let's make an investigation. I have a little thing that represents the sun. See that little yellow nubbin? And I can move it along the dates of the ecliptic, which I'm going to teach you about later. And I'm sorry, did you say February 27th? Yes. Okay. <laughs> this is great. So it might be a little difficult for you to see. Let me go to the speaker view here. Check this out, buddy. On February 27th, when you were born, probably sometime in the last 20 or 30 years, I don't know how old you are, but, but this globe is much more recent than Ptolemy's Tetrabiblos. When you were born, the sun was actually in the constellation of Aquarius. So, so Whitney, I got a question for you. If astrology is supposed to be your, if your sun sign is supposed to be where the sun is on your B-day, what does it mean to you that the sun was actually in Aquarius on the day you were born? Does that make you an Aquarius or does that, that change my whole world? And I don't even know what I should do right now. Yeah, I don't know either. I think you should register for astronomy 1010, the solar system with your pal, Brendan Britton and discover all sorts of cool things about the universe. That's an idea. Um, <laughs> uh, here, guys. So <clears throat> people get these things confused, right? What about this? This is what I want to talk about. Anyone know what this is, this picture? This is an iconic rock star photograph from outer space. It's called the Horsehead Nebula. It's named after this little seahorsey shaped cloud of hydrogen gas. This is what the real universe is all about, my friends. It's way freakier and weirder and crazier and more abstract than anything you read on your co-star, all right? And most of the universe, most of reality is this stuff. It's cold clouds of hydrogen gas floating and glowing in outer space giant spheres of plasma with nuclear reactions inside them, crusty little bits of dried out planets rotating around them. That's some weird stuff. And I wanna know more about that. You can't read about this in your co-star, okay? So what's the moral of my story? I don't know what you guys plan on learning during this summer session, but let's all start by learning this important fact. Astronomy, does not equal astrology. They're not the same thing. 
And if you write me an email and you say, dear Professor Britton, I am in your astrology 1010 class. I am going to move my mouse over to the delete button and pretend like I don't know you. <laughs> okay. So I don't want, I don't want to hear anyone making that mistake. Uh, and with that in mind, welcome to our class. Okay. Welcome to Astronomy 1010, the solar system. We're, we're going to learn about all kinds of cool things in outer space. Although this class focuses mostly on the solar system and learning about the planets, which are interesting. And I've got lots of fun pictures to show you along the way. And I will be your tour guide. Here's a quite an old photo of me now in front of the uh, CCRI's 16 inch Mead telescope. We actually have an observatory on campus in the backwoods uh, on, the, on the night campus in Warwick. And if this were normal times, <clears throat> during the course of the semester, I would take you guys out to that observatory and I would put your eyeball up to the lens and let you look at the moon and planets and it would blow your damned mind. Now, COVID happened and we're all coping, but I think the plan is for us to reopen the observatory this fall. So if you guys will be around in fall and you would like to come out to my observatory, it's not a requirement for the course, it's just a bonus. Um, I should be running public open nights every Wednesday night when it is clear, okay? So if you guys would like to come and take a look at the telescope, I'd love to have you there. Um, <clears throat> maybe even I'll consider doing a summertime. I have to find out from the administration if I'm allowed to have people in there or not. I'm not sure what the protocol is. Anyways, our class is about astronomy. I hope you guys have figured that out yet. And uh, my name is Brendan Britton. I've been teaching this course uh, many years, and I'm a professor here at uh, Community College. And uh, I know some things not only about outer space, but also about how to have a good class with you guys. So today, as you have to do at the beginning of any college course, we're going to have to have some discussions about like how grades are done and and what to expect from me. And I know that's not really fun to talk about, but you guys probably want to understand how this class is going to be run. And for the most part, I've worked very hard to make it easy and fun. Mostly you just have to sit back, watch astronomy TV, and just do whatever the hell I tell you to do and show up and then things will work themselves out. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's talk. Uh, what's, what are my next talking points? So who are you? Well, uh, luckily I can see your names, right? I got Nicole and Whitney and Joey and Nina. Um, I've never had any of you as students before, so it's gonna take a little while for me to get to know you. But whoever you are, I hope you come to class or if you're in the, you know, watching the show later on tonight, I hope that every time you log in and watch one of these shows, you come with two things. The first is a calculator, and I'm gonna tell you exactly what model I want you to buy. And the second is a positive attitude because any class, any college course is not always fun. It involves a little bit of hard work. But remember, you did this to yourself, right? You paid $550 to listen to me talk about icy comets and horse head shapes of gas in outer space. Thank you for your patronage, by the way. I really appreciate that. So I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna do my job every day, no matter how much it hurts. I hope we can try to have some fun with it and, and, and enjoy this time. Um, I'm going to talk about the calculator in just a moment. Uh, what are we going to study during the semester? We're going to learn all about the solar system. You can think of this as a thinly veiled planetary geology course. And luckily for you, the solar system is a cool place to hang out in, okay? You've got Earth. That's where you live. And we're going to learn quite a bit about our own planet in this journey, and it's going to be fun. We'll learn about the moon, which is beautiful. We all like to look at the moon. And it might be nice to even show it to you through a telescope at some point. The sun is a big part of our solar system and it's connected to the lives of the planets. So we're gonna have a chapter studying the sun, which should be pretty interesting. And we're also going to get into the eight planets and probably a little bit of physics too. There are no longer nine planets. Pluto, do you guys know about Pluto? What the deal is? Why isn't Pluto a planet? Was it too far away or something? 
No, we always knew how far away it was. That wasn't the issue. Was it too small of a planet? It is definitely smaller than the other planets. But Joey, we always knew that it was small and we accepted it as a planet anyways. What made astronomers kick it out of the solar system? Well, they didn't really kick it out of the solar system. They just changed its classification. You know, back in the day when Ma and Pa took an astronomy class, there was the sun and there were the nine planets and Pluto was the last one. And then people believed that there was nothing else after that. Well, eventually there would be stars, but there was this big empty blank space, just outer space with nothing in it. The problem is there's actually stuff out there, but it was too faint and too dark to be seen until we developed really powerful telescopes and started staring out into the darkness carefully, very carefully for long periods of time. And when we did this, we started to discover other things that looked a lot like Pluto. They're small, icy, rocky objects, kind of like an overgrown comet. Um, some of them have lumpy shapes. Some of them have little moons and some of them have very squishy orbits. And after we found about a dozen of these things, people started thinking, geez, what happens if, if we find one that's bigger than Pluto? Are we gonna make that a planet? Because it seems like we kind of have to. But then they got some graduate student to do a little calculation and they discovered, well, geez, if we've already found, you know, like 50 of these things and we've only been looking for a couple of years, they estimated that there could be like anywhere from 100,000 to a million of these so-called Kuiper belt objects floating out there with Pluto. In other words, there are hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of Plutos, and some of them are bigger than Pluto. And eventually they found one in 2003. The guy who found it tried to name it Xena because he liked the TV show, Xena, Warrior Princess. And the International Astronomical Union said, no, 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 we can't let you do that. Um, so we eventually named it Eris. And Eris caused a kind of psychotic break for planetary astronomers. They had to decide if we were gonna have a solar system with 100,000 things that looked like Pluto and then eight other weird objects, or if instead it made more sense to redefine what we meant by a planet. And they used the fact that Pluto's orbit is a bit squishy and it, it's surrounded by other objects similar to itself. But Pluto is still interesting. We now just consider it a dwarf planet along with Eris and this giant asteroid, uh, asteroid called Ceres. So these are the kind of things that I wanna teach you about um, during the course of this semester, okay? Because this is a physical science class, it's going to involve measurements and measurements tend to make you wanna do a little bit of math. Astronomy is deeply connected to the subject of physics and some of our lectures are basically gonna be straight up physics lectures or baby physics lectures. And this class is gonna involve some math at the level of about an algebra one class. And I know that causes people some anxiety. Um, one person wrote me and said, hey, look, I haven't taken a math class in forever. I didn't know there was a prerequisite. There is no prerequisite in math for this course. And that's because I'm gonna assume that you are not really good at math. That's usually a good assumption, by the way. Okay, and so I'm gonna teach you what you need to know as we go. And all you're gonna really need to do is follow my instructions. Now, the first instruction and the most important instruction, I wanna find the two different versions here is that I need you to buy a very particular calculator because there's a lot of you and there's a bunch of you at home watching this video later who don't even get to talk to me. I mean, you can write me an email, whatever, but most of you won't end up talking to me. it will just hide in the shadows like trolls. I'm gonna give very particular instructions for how to do the math in this class on, on this calculator. There's two different versions of it, but they're the, exactly the same. It's the Casio, hold on. I have a focus control here. Oop. It's the Casio. Hmm. Sorry guys, I'm, that's fuzzy. Hold on a second. There we go, okay. It's the Casio FX260 solar calculator. You're gonna love this calculator. It only costs eight bucks at Walmart. 
It's solar powered, which is kind of symbolic for an astronomy class. The batteries will never die on you. It doesn't weigh a lot. And it has all the buttons that you're going to want to use in a convenient to locate place. Now, I don't care if you've got your own calculator. I don't even care if you took calculus two and you think you're a hot shit. I want you all to buy this calculator. I'd rather you buy this $8 calculator than the $100 book, okay? Because then I can give one set of instructions for everyone and then we can all learn to do math together. Does that make sense? Is that something that I can ask of you that you will purchase, you will make an $8 investment in the solar system? <laughs> okay, because if you don't do this, life is gonna be hard for you, okay? <laughs> and I don't want life to be hard for you. I'm not gonna make life hard for me. I'm gonna give one set of instructions. It gets too messy to try to, you know, to do this a bunch of different ways. I hope I've impressed upon you the importance of this. Um, from what I could tell earlier, no one actually bought this calculator yet. And I can kind of understand that because I didn't even update the page until yesterday. So that's probably not your fault. That's probably my fault. Um, <clears throat> I am contemplating having you guys do a pre-recorded lab today. So the whole purpose of our first lab is to train you guys on how to use this thing, okay? So if no one has it, that's a little weird. So I might have you guys do the pre-recorded version of this lab once you buy the calculator, okay? Does that make sense? All right. But in general, uh, we have five people here. And even though Emmanuel is a troll, I consider this enough for us to have a cool live class together. So that works for me, okay? All right, so now this brings up some other questions, like how does this class work? Um, before we talk about the solar system, let's talk a little bit about the classroom system so you guys can learn how we're gonna do things during this summer session, okay? Um, our class meets, well, this is an asynchronous course, technically. So in theory, what you guys were probably expecting, and you can have this experience if you want, is I'll post a bunch of videos, you watch the videos and you do the work. And I think that's how a lot of other professors do this. My way of thinking, which is a little old fashioned, is that it's cool to at least offer some of you the opportunity to sit through a live lecture as if we were at CCRI together. You know what I'm saying? I'm assuming that some of you are here because of that. Uh, in previous classes, I found that on the first day, Lots of people show up, and then as the semester goes on, the, the attendance kind of drops a bit. Here's the thing. I've already got all of these lectures recorded. It would be really easy for me to just give you those recordings and let you go. You know what I would do then? I would take a walk in the sunshine. I'd read a book. I'd fly a kite. I'd do any number of one million things I'd like to do. And I could do that. But in general, I'm willing to hang out here and spend this time with you if you get something out of the live experience. And I've still been trying to figure out how valuable that is over this past year. You guys can tell me. Um, one of the students I talked to in a previous semester, when I really pressed them hard, they said, well, you know, Brennan, I actually kind of liked the pre-recorded lecture because then I could like pause it and I could check the mail and I could get a drink and then I could come back and finish it. So it might be that I'm just wasting my effing time here. I don't know. Um, but if you guys keep showing up, I'll keep doing this. Um, if, if something comes up, like if I get sick or something weird happens, maybe I'll ask, or like today where no one has the calculator, I might have you watch the pre-recorded lab. That makes sense to me. But this is enough people for me to hold a live class if you guys want that. So n since you're here, why don't we talk for a second? I imagine some of you might've just kind of shown up because you're like, what the hell is this class all about? Let's find out what's going on. Do you guys think it would be better to have the pre-recorded lectures that you could just sort of watch whenever? Or do you prefer to do this live thing? I personally prefer live, but. Okay. So we got one vote for live anyways. I also prefer live. It's just my work schedule is kind of weird right now. So there might be days where I can't come. And that's why it's cool that I'm, you know, I'm recording this right now so that I can post this version of our class um, to Blackboard. What I do is every day after the lecture in the lab, I 
I render the video that takes about an hour or so, and then I post it to Blackboard. And so someone like Nicole or some of those other 28 minus five people that are out there who some of you did talk to me and say, I'd love to come, but I got work during the day. That makes sense to me, you know? So you guys will be able to watch those videos. You watch the lab and we're gonna do the lab together. And then you submit the assignment and it's good. So it won't be a big deal if you can't make it, Nicole. The only thing I was worried about at the beginning is, what if there's only one person? What if there's only two people? That's kind of, I don't know. It doesn't have enough energy to almost feel like a class. You know what I mean? Um, in that case, if there's only one or two people, I might just farm it out to the pre-recording, you know, just because it's, it's almost like listening in on a private conversation. I, I don't know. I'm still wrapping my head around that, but this is enough people for me to do it. I can interact with four people just fine. Okay. So let's get to it. Let's talk about the grading stuff. Um, let's, uh, most of you said that you did get to look at the syllabus. Uh, if not, I'm assuming you can see my screen. Uh, let's pop over to Blackboard in case someone out there doesn't know how to use it. On the left, you can see these tabs where I've got stuff for us to do. Um, <clears throat> this is the syllabus and schedule tab. And you guys can download or you can open up the syllabus and the schedule. I've already done that. The syllabus is kind of just fluff. It just has stuff that you need to know. This is my email. This is my personal cell phone number. Since I don't have uh, an office that you can come to, I'm okay if you guys want to occasionally text me or call me. I'm a normal human just like you, and I don't mind you know, you can call me whatever. You just might have to put up with whatever state of inebriation I'm in at the time, but I will try to help you as best as I can, right? Um, if you guys want to have a, a private meeting about something at some point, like people who used to come by my office, we can set up a little one-on-one -on -one Zoom to talk about something if you have a personal issue, whatever. Otherwise, here's the plan. <clears throat> We're gonna do lecture from 12 to three. Um, that's how long a typical, uh, four-hour class lecture is. Our laboratory is supposed to be 3 to 4.30, but I'm going to try to cut some corners and try to finish by 4. I know you guys have other things to do in your life. Um, the homework for this class is really challenging. And if I let you try to do it by yourself, you'd probably do a bad job and you would get upset and then I would get upset. So a better solution instead of doing that is we should probably just meet and all do the homework together. That will actually be the most efficient for you time-wise, and it will keep your grades really, really high. So I'm offering to basically do the homework for you. You just have to show up and follow along with me, okay? Um, but the only time that makes sense to me, and I'm not much of a morning person, but starting on Wednesday, I'm gonna hold office hours, optional office hours, okay? Where from 10 to 12, two hours before class, I will log into Zoom, and I will do all the five homework problems that are due that day, all right? And what you should probably do is you should probably, if you can afford to be there live, I don't know if you can, but you should, I will record them of course and post them later as well. But either you have to participate and watch or you have to watch the recordings of me doing it. That way you make sure you do the homework right. I wanna spell this out really bold and careful here. Don't do the homework on your own, do it with me, okay? It's more efficient that way. It's faster for you and it's better for you. Um, okay, so with that in mind, let's talk about the whole damn grade thing, okay? So here we are, slide 27. Showing up to lecture is worth 0% of your grade. That's because you paid me to learn about this stuff. And if you don't want to learn about this stuff, if you want to just pay me and not show up, I'm cool with that. That's actually even better for me, okay? However, uh, you will probably find it difficult to know what the hell is going on if you don't occasionally watch one of these lectures or participate in our class. So I would strongly encourage you to, to join in. I will try not to waste your time. I will try to put efficient things up on the board that will help you during exams, okay? Um, the lab portion of this class is worth 25% of your grade, which is a big chunk. Luckily for you, lab is pretty easy to do. Um, I even kind of photocopied the pages that you need. And since we can't be in a laboratory together, what will happen is I'll set up uh, 
a little demonstration over there in my lab room, which is just my desk. And I'll use a remote camera to kind of take measurements and move things along a slide ruler or whatever. And, and we'll kind of just, you'll sort of like, I'll be the hands and the camera will be the eyes and you guys will copy down the information. You're just gonna follow along and you're gonna try to learn something, but it's not stressful. You just have to put the hour in to do it with me, okay? So as this, the whole moral of the story for this class is just don't be a flake. If you just show up and you kind of just copy down what I tell you to copy down, you're gonna do fine and you're gonna pass the class with flying colors. The only thing you can do bad is slack so hard that you don't do anything or turn anything in. That's when you get into the ugliness, okay? So lab is worth a quarter of your grade. We do that after lecture. Homework is also worth a quarter of your grade. We do that before lecture. Like I said, typically in a science course like this, you have something called a problem set. You have five problems that you have to do for every class. And I used to make people do it the old fashioned way where you go home by yourself in the dark and you try to do this. And that didn't work so well because most of you haven't had a science course like this before. That's not your fault. It's not your fault that you don't know what to do. I'm supposed to show you how to do it. So I realized that if I did the homework with you guys, you would actually learn better. You'd get it done faster than you would on your own. And then I would be a lot happier when I graded your papers and I wouldn't get as angry, okay? So we both have a win-win here to do that homework together. Um, <clears throat> if you can't attend some part of the course, as Nicole says, she might have work some days, I'll be recording this and I'll be posting it to Blackboard. When you get home from work and you're all sleepy and tired and you're eating your frozen TV dinner, then you do it then, okay, Nicole? Um, to give you guys a little bit of wiggle room, in general, we have a lab each class. This is a summer class, right? So each, each day we meet is like a whole week long chapter, which is kind of insane. So we have a lab every class and we have a homework every class except this one today because this is the start, right? So we are gonna have lab today, but we won't have homework. But starting on Wednesday, I'm gonna do office hours. We're gonna do the homework before class, then we'll do lecture then we'll do lab. It's going to be a long day. I'm going to own your life for a little while. I'll try to have some tea breaks and pauses so that we can all like chill out. Usually I like to do tea break around 1.30 for, for a three hour class. That's like 20 minutes to have tea or do whatever it is you want to do. Okay. Um, I do understand that it's very difficult to listen to someone talk for that amount of time. I, I just don't know what other solution there is. Um, <clears throat> The only other way you can score points in this class, oh, uh, hold on one second, guys. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so, I'll try to put some pauses and some breaks in there, like I just did. Uh, the only other place that you guys need to earn points in this class, besides homework and besides lab, are the exams. Now, exams are scary and stressful, and everybody hates them. So I've tried to reduce it to as few as possible. During a normal summer semester, I would have one midterm halfway through and one final. What I've discovered, especially in these COVID Zoom times is it's actually kind of cool to just give you a midterm and then give you the option to skip the final and just double the grade that you got for your midterm. So I think we should really focus on hitting that midterm hard. And then at the end of the semester, when everything's falling apart and our lives are going to pieces and we're not doing our work anymore, then we can just avoid the stress of that, okay? So the date that I have, well, okay. There's a lot to talk about and it's taken me a while to do it, okay? Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna show you the syllabus in a second, but I want you guys to keep this in mind. Your grade is like a number system, right? I add up all the points you got for homework and all the points you got for lab, and I add up the points you got for a midterm. And if you wanna skip the final, I'll just double the midterm grade. And then I divide by four and that's your grade. And I'm probably going to put a little bit of a curve on that final score. I'll tell you about that after our midterm. I have a little bit of a curve to help things. 
but mostly your grades and number system. And the simple truth is, if you just turn in all your labs and all your homeworks, it won't even matter how bad you do on the exam, you'll still pass the class. The only way to fail this class is to not turn in labs and not turn in homeworks. Now, the way this works, let's take a look at our schedule and our syllabus here. The other paper that I, that I gave to you, which is actually the more important paper is this one. This is gonna be the grid that kind of keeps us on track. And this is our plan for the entire seven week semester. Today's Monday, May 24th. The title of our class is The Nighttime Sky, some little bitty notes on what you're gonna be learning about. If you do have a book like Nina does, uh, we're gonna follow chapter two, okay? Today's lab is measurements and powers of 10. These five homework problems for homework one, that's the homework that I will go over Wednesday from 10 to 12, okay? This week, we'll have lab one today, homework one on Wednesday, and lab two on Wednesday. So that's three assignments for this week. For anyone watching the videos later, I will give you until Sunday at 11 p.m. to turn those things in. On Sunday night, late at night, I grade all the work for the week. It's a very unhappy time for me. And then I close the books for that week. I can't let you guys turn in anything any old time you want, because literally all 28 times two of you will wait until the last day of class and then try to turn in everything. And then I will fucking hate you all. Okay. I cannot have, and I've, had people, not like one person, like a lot of people do this to me. I cannot grade all those papers in one day. So we have to do this in bite-sized morsels. Do you understand? I need to make this rule really, really important. Now, obviously, like if you got in a car accident and you lost your arm, maybe we can horse trade a little bit for like a day, all right? One, one day per limb, that's the rule I'm gonna make. But bearing some completely hideous accident I think, oh, you know, giving you until Sunday should be enough time to do this. Does that sound reasonable? Can you do that for me, please? Okay. Even if you do have work, you should be able to squeeze out just two hours for lab and two hours for homework between now and Sunday. I guarantee you it's less time than you will have to spend on other similar courses, all right? I'm not asking you to write any crazy papers, do any group projects or presentations. It's the minimum amount of stuff that could possibly be done and I do it with you, okay? So you couldn't ask for a better deal. <clears throat> Just get it in each week. If you don't, it's gonna be a zero and that's that. Okay, um, so yeah, uh, by the way, the homework problems are from the book. Um, you'll notice when you, when you look at the homework section that I've actually scanned the problems and I'm gonna try to train you on how to do them so you'll be ready for them during the course of our lectures. So I know I'm kind of going on and on about the administrative stuff here, but let me just show you the screen. Let's go to homework session. Excuse me here. Blackboard is glitchy. I'm sure you guys know this already. Um, this is our first homework assignment, make available, which we'll do uh, before class on Wednesday. See this thing here, this chapter two PDF? That's a scan of the questions from the book. So when it comes time to do the homework, usually like a couple of the questions will be like a short answer or an essay question. Here's our first one, a new planet. A planet in the solar system has a circular orbit and an axis tilt of 35 degrees. Would you expect this planet to have seasons? If so, would you expect them to be more extreme than the seasons on earth? If not, why not? Now you guys probably don't know the answer to this yet because we haven't had a lecture on it but hopefully you will by the time it's time to do our homework. And if you don't, I'll explain it to you, okay? But some of the problems we're gonna do like a little paragraph or two essay. Some of the problems are gonna be math questions that ask you to calculate the diameter of the sun or convert an angle from degrees to arc minutes. I'm gonna train you on all of that and I'm gonna show you how to do it with your Casio calculator. You just have to work with me, okay? All right. That concludes lecture zero, which is kind of just how the mechanics of the class work. You guys will notice also that I've provided you with some really crappy Roman numeral outlines 
in the section called lecture notes, okay? So today, excuse me, these things are a little glitchy. Um, today, we're trying to cover lecture zero and lecture one starts today and I, well, yeah, actually, we're supposed to complete all of lecture one. So uh, these are not inclusive study guides, but if you do want to kind of understand my top-down structure and how I'm trying to go, this is the stuff. See what we just did there? We did astronomy versus astrology. Welcome to astronomy uh, 1010. You got to have some math. Here's how our class works. You see all that? And now, uh, in a few moments, we'll have a pause, but now we're going to get into the uh, first lecture, which is lecture one, okay? And lecture one is where we actually learn some astronomy stuff and we start getting into it. Uh, I also have PowerPoint slides uh, in one of those tabs. So you'll see me using these different PowerPoint slides during our class. I've tried to provide all of that for you if you ever wanna look at that by yourself. Okay, do you guys have any questions before we start doing some real work here, talking astronomy? I covered everything, that's how good I am, huh? Okay. For anyone watching later, I just want to repeat myself. If we do hold a live class, I will post the day's live class in lab. If we do a pre-recording, I will repost that link for you as well. Um, when I have to, to make a video of these lectures, I have to render them and that takes a couple of hours. So once class in lab ends, I have to sit there and let my computer print it, and then I have to upload it to, uh, to, to YouTube. So just remember that it might not be that the second class ends, you won't see the video there. It's gonna take a couple of hours. So Nicole, if you're ever at work someday, you probably won't see the posting until like 6 p.m. because it takes a couple hours to print it. Does that make sense? Every now and then I do something really stupid and I get distracted and I go on a bike ride because. I can't sit there and watch it for two hours. I would go crazy, right? So every now and then I forget to post it. If that happens, will one of you please text me or email me immediately and be like, WTF, where's the lecture? And then I'll be like, oh, oh my God, I can't believe I forgot. That happens not often, but every now and then, okay? Just wanna you know, help you guys keep me on task here. Okay, um, let's get into it. Let's do some stuff. Uh, we're now gonna go into lecture one which is some basic stuff about astronomy. To do that, I'm gonna take us over to one of our slideshows here. Uh, let me escape lecture zero. Let me enter lecture one, function F5. Okay, do you guys know what this is? What are you looking at here? No, you don't know what this is? Is it Orion's? That's right. How'd you know it was Orion, Nicole? I really like constellations. <laughs> I, I really like constellations too. But what tells you that this is Orion? What do you know about Orion? The three stars in the middle is Orion's belt. That's right. That's the belt of Orion, right? And then this star is called Betelgeuse. That's one of his shoulders. This star here is another shoulder, okay? Down here, this bright blue star is called Rigel. Rigel, someone in my apartment is making tea. One second. Could we turn that thing off? Bloody hell. Thank you very much. Ah, I love working from home. Okay, anyways. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> um, this, this star, the foot of Orion is Rigel, okay? This star up here, this red star is called Betelgeuse. I'll be talking about Betelgeuse from time to time. I'm not even gonna, you know what? Let's get the text tool out. Oops. So we have Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse, the star came before the movie, okay? Betelgeuse is the red shoulder of Orion. Rigel is the blue foot of Orion. Um, in addition to the belt in this foot here, these three stars that hang down are called the Sword of Orion. A cool thing that you might not have known about, Nicole, is the middle star in the sword is actually not a star, but a nebula. 
And if you zoom in on that with a pair of binoculars or a telescope, you remember that picture I showed you earlier of the Horsehead Nebula? It kind of looks like that. It's a, it's a beautiful, in fact, I took a picture of the Orion Nebula with one of my former students. And I bet just for fun, just for entertainment purposes, I could show you that picture. Uh, oh, I don't want to do this here. No, let's go here. Dropbox, Astro. Can you guys see this? This, uh, me and a former student, Carly, took this photograph together. And that's what that, that one thing that looked like a little fuzzy star, that's what you see if you zoom in on it with a telescope. You see this beautiful nebula and four stars in the center called the trapezium. Okay, so why am I showing you this? Orion is one of the 88 constellations in the sky, but you can't see Orion every night. You can only see it certain times of the year. Nicole, do you know enough about Orion to know when it's visible in our local sky? Well, you'll notice it in the autumn and in the winter time and almost into spring, but Orion has just disappeared from the sky. So you won't be able to see it again until maybe November or maybe October if you stay up very late. The constellations that are up in your sky each night are constantly changing. The nighttime sky is constantly changing. You even have to learn about how to talk to me and to each other about stars intelligently. There's a whole language involved in that. And that's kind of one of the ideas behind our first lecture is how do we talk intelligently about stars? How do we describe their motions across the sky? How do we think properly when we look up? These are things that it took people thousands of years to develop. And I'm gonna digest it into a couple of three hour lectures and train you, okay? So I'm gonna also teach you some skills along the way too. Um, let's look at one of our next slides here. Uh, you obviously know that you live on earth and Earth, as we mentioned in our previous portion of the lecture, is one of eight planets in our solar system. So for those of you who don't know what the solar system is, the solar system is the sun. Okay, that makes up the majority of the matter in our solar system. There are eight planets. There are some little dirtbag dwarf planets like Eris and Pluto. And there's a big fat asteroid called Ceres, which you probably never heard about. The solar system also includes asteroids, which are mostly located between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter. There are the asteroids. It also includes comets. Some of the comets, uh, the Kuiper Belt ones, are kind of near Pluto and Eris. There's a whole other reservoir of comets that orbits around the solar system. That's the Oort cloud. That's something else entirely. So the planets and the sun, the dwarf planets, the asteroids, the comets, also maybe a little bit of dust in some magnetic fields. That's what a solar system is. And I'm going to teach you about all those different components in good time. What happens if you leave the solar system? What is outside the solar system? Do you know? No? The next level of structure, is it just empty space? Marshmallows. Maybe more solar systems. More solar systems. And does it just go more solar Maybe. systems forever? Yeah. Maybe no. things like that, like space stuff. Yeah, I want to, I'm just, you know, sometimes I just got to figure out what you guys know so I know how to talk to you, okay? What about the, like the Milky Way? Yeah. The galaxies That's the and all that? Galaxies, right? So um, the, the closest star to the sun is Alpha Centauri. That's maybe four light years away. But if you could keep zooming out, you would realize that we are one solar system, one star in a group of planets out of a great assemblage of stars. And a galaxy, uh, Joey, also contains gas and dust, okay? So a galaxy is basically a big swirl of stars and gas. And there are some other freaky things in there too, but I don't want to tell you about those just yet. For the most part, it's just stars and gas. And our galaxy, the one that we live in, is called the Milky Way galaxy. And the sun orbits the center of the Milky Way galaxy about 30,000 light years from its center. So our sun is kind of like out in the suburbs, okay, orbiting around the center of the galaxy. 
this is not a real photograph. This is an artist illustration, right? We had to hire one of our weed smoking artist friends, put some spray paint in their hand and have them paint this picture for us. Why don't I have a real picture of the Milky Way, Joey, or friends? Does anyone know why I can't show you an actual photograph of the Milky Way? Is it like too far out? That's kind of how to say it. It's too big, we're too small, and we would have to go too far away to see it, right? So, but Joey, I think you meant the right thing. Um, we're like a little ladybug sitting on a leaf inside of a forest. It would be difficult for the ladybug, she would have to leave the forest and then look back to see the whole thing, right? We do not have the technical capabilities or even the time to, to take a spacecraft outside of the Milky Way galaxy. It's just way too vast a distance. So weirdly, the only galaxy that I cannot show you a picture of is our own galaxy. <laughs> That's kind of confusing. But we can see other galaxies outside of our own. Um, can you guys see this internet thing here? Can you see what I'm doing? Okay, probably one of the most famous galaxies in space is our sister galaxy, the one that's sort of closest to us. And that's the Andromeda galaxy. So we believe that our own Milky Way galaxy probably looks pretty darn similar to Andromeda if you could, you know, fly outside of it and look back. And look at this beautiful thing here. You can, um, <clears throat> by the time you get far enough away to look at a galaxy, you can't really see individual stars anymore. All the starlight kind of just blends together into a smear of light. So do you see this thing here? You guys probably think that looks like a single star. That's actually a giant spheroid of billions of stars all revolving around each other. Um, if you can see a star like this is a star, that star is probably not in Andromeda. That star is actually in the foreground in the Milky Way. So to go back to that ladybug analogy, if I was a ladybug on a leaf and I looked out of the forest, I'd probably have to look through a few trees in the foreground, right? So these stars, this one and this one and this one, these are stars that are in between our sun and looking out of the galaxy to, the, to Andromeda. Um, for those of you who are curious, um, if, you, if you do kind of leave the Milky Way galaxy, I've got a little slide on that too. You'd be in something called the local group. So this is probably as far as I'll get until you take the other version of my course, but here's Milky Way and there's Andromeda. They're like 3 million light years apart, but both the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy have these little dirt bag galaxies, which kind of orbit around us. So we actually have like little baby galaxies that orbit us. And sometimes we eat those baby galaxies and digest them. Galaxies collide, they do all kinds of messed up things. That's not really the purpose of our course. But there's a reason I'm telling you all this stuff. I wanna start off thinking about big numbers and how we talk intelligently about large things and great numbers of things. There's no reason you should know the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy, but I'm gonna ask you to guess. What if you had to take a guess? How many stars do you think there are in the Milky Way galaxy? Billion. billion. It's greater than a billion. It's close to a trillion. I think the best estimate is like 300 billion, but I'm going to lie and I'm going to tell you it's a trillion stars because it's kind of close. Okay. And because I like lying to my students. That's something I do for fun every now and then. Okay. Let's take some notes and let's do some work. Oh, by the way, um, after this little lesson, we'll take a tea break and give your brain some time to relax, okay? So just stick with me a little bit longer. Okay, this is your first lesson of the day. I really strongly suggest you write down what I write down, okay? Lesson one is on something called scientific notation. I've been trying to squeeze some life out of this marker from last semester, but I think it's, I think it's just done. 
Um, you guys are so good. You deserve a fresh marker. I deserve a fresh marker too. Okay. So scientific notation is how we talk about big numbers. And this is a skill, unfortunately, that each and every one of you needs to master for us to even take one step into the solar system together. So this is not going to be super fun, but it's super necessary. Um, we're going to start by considering the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And like I told you, I'm about to lie to you. And I'm going to tell you that there are one trillion stars. I'm betting that not everyone out there in the studio audience knows how big a trillion is. Or do you? How many zeros are in the number one trillion? No? 12. Let's write it down. 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 stars. There are 1 trillion stars, roughly, in the Milky Way galaxy. That's a big number. And to demonstrate just how big it is, I'd like to hold up the calculator that we're going to use yeah. in this video. Sorry, was, was that background chatter or did someone want to ask me something? Okay, let's just our autofocus here. Watch this, watch me do something, okay? This is the calculator that we're gonna use in this class. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, that's it. You wanna know what that means to me? There are 10 decimal spaces available to us on the Casio FX260 solar calculator. However, for this number, we actually need 13 spaces, right? 12 for the zeros and a 13th for the number one. In other words, we cannot plug the number one trillion into our Casio calculator in the old fashioned way. That's a problem. And the reason why that's a problem is because this is a, you know, I said big number. This is actually a small number to astronomers. We're going to be working with numbers that are much bigger than 1 trillion. So we can no longer afford to do things in the old way. We need a way to compact this both for our calculators, for our brains, and for our papers when we do our homework. And that technique is called scientific notation. How many of you have had to do this? in some kind of a high school class, or maybe even at CCRI. Has anyone seen scientific notation before? Okay, Nina and Nicole. Okay, so a couple of you. And it's not gonna hurt to have a little review of it because we're gonna need to do this all the time, okay? So the way this works is we're gonna make use of powers of 10. So if you remember back to your good old and oldie days in math, um, let me just, let me clean up a little space over here somewhere. Uh, okay, so in your in the golden days, ten to the power of one kind of means one ten, maybe multiplied by a one, and ten squared means you multiply two tens together. Ten times ten is a hundred, and ten cubed means you multiply three tens together. 10 times 10 times 10 is 1,000. After a while, you start to zoom out in your brain and you realize, you know what 10 to the 3 really means? 10 to the power of 3 means a 1 with three zeros, right? So 10 to the power of 4 is 10,000, a 1 followed by four zeros. OK, now you guys try it. What is 10 to the power of 0? Is it zero? It is not. What? Or is it, wait, I don't, th I don't think so. Well, we just decided that 10 to the power of three is a one followed by three zeros. Is it one? Yeah. You know what's weird, Nicole? 
In mathematics, one is the default number. Zero is not a default number. Zero might be the default number in your bank account, but that's not the same thing as algebra, okay? If, you're, if 10 to the power of one is 10 times one, it's 110. 10 to the power of zero is no 10, but you leave the one behind, not a zero, right? Another way to think about it is if, if, if 10 to the four is a one followed by four zeros, then 10 to the zero is a one followed by no zeros, right? That's a different way to think about it. Okay. Hey, don't forget that. That's going to come in handy in today's lab, okay? We can use powers of 10 in math to compact the number 1 trillion. Let's have a little discussion about terms before we do that. This number, the number one, is called the lead digit. Try this again. The lead digit. The lead digit is the first number in your number as long as it's not zero. Lead digits can be one through nine, okay? Then we have this bit of the number. You could think of this as the number of zeros. Um, people also sometimes call it, uh, well, you can call it the power of 10. Here's another fancy term you see journalists use sometimes or scientists. They also refer to the general size of your number as the order of magnitude. Order of magnitude is kind of a funny way to talk about numbers, okay? Let's say you're 25 years old. The order of magnitude associated with your age is 10. Obviously, you're not 10 years old, but 25 is a number whose order of magnitude is 10 because it has the same number of digits. The number 100 to 1,000 is a uh, order of 100 or something like that. The last part of this number that's kind of important, stars, is our unit. And units are of extreme importance in all science courses, physical science classes like math, chem well, uh, physics and chemistry and uh, astronomy. The units tell you what it is you are measuring, and we must always take great care to put those little labels next to our numbers when we do our homework. I'm going to make a thing about this, okay? I've been known to take points off of homework problems if you don't list the units with your number. So let's pay close attention to that. Okay, now that I've diagrammed the number, lead digit, power of 10 units, we're gonna rewrite the whole thing using powers of 10 to compact it. So all I do is I write down my lead digit, the number one. Actually, all right, let me just clear up some space here. I write down the lead digit, I multiply it by 10 to the power of the number of zeros. In this case, it's 10 to the power of 12. And then I write down the unit stars. That is how adults say 1 trillion to each other, okay? 1 times 10 to the 12 stars. Even though it looks like a math problem, you're not supposed to multiply them together, really. You're supposed to just let it sit there, okay? The way we enter this into our Casios is we use a very important key called our EXP key. And EXP is basically your scientific notation key. Let me focus this a bit better here. Uh, that was not good enough. How's th That's too close. Hold on. I'm trying to find a sweet spot here. Okay, I think I can work with, okay. Sorry guys, I do this all the time, but I'm a little rusty in the saddle today. Or maybe there's some goo in the lens, is that what it is? Okay. Sorry. Um, EXP is your power of 10 key. So if I wanna put the number 1 trillion into my calculator, I would do one, I don't type times 10, I just do EXP 
and then 12. I'm sorry, guys. This, the focus on this uh, camera is driving me nuts. And it used to be that the right spot was, was to turn my autofocus to around. Oh, I think they, they changed this. That actually looks pretty clear, I guess. OK. So I want you to notice this. When I type 1 times 10 to the 12 in my calculator, I just do 1 exp 12. You see that? All right. That's important. This is also another reason why I need you guys to have these calculators is because I'm going to train you to do stuff on them every day. Let's take some notes here. I want to erase this and I want to take some notes about how we type it into our calculator so that you guys can remember later on. Eh. Okay. Okay. So for the number one trillion, a one followed by 12 zeros is written on the page one times 10 to the 12 stars. When you type it into your calculator, you will type one exp key 12. You are not allowed to write that down on the paper. You have to write this down on the paper. What you will see on the display is one with a little 12 above it. That means scientific notation mode. You are not allowed to write that down on your paper, okay? See, they don't have enough room to put in the times 10. That would be wasteful. They're relying on you to be smart and to understand calculator speak, OK? Is it clear to you guys why you are not allowed to write? You will never, ever write on your page 1 to the power of 12, right? What is 1 to the power of 12? Does anyone understand the point that I'm trying to make? I'm worried that you're lost. There's glare. Someone explain why you can't write that down on a paper when you're doing your homework. Because one to the 12th power would be one multiplied 12 times. And the answer to that is one, right? Yeah. <laughs> what? So in other words, if this means one times one times one times one 12 times, and that's equal to one, one does not equal one trillion, right? So in other words, Nicole, if you're someone like me and you speak math, if someone writes that down, I'm not gonna think you mean a trillion. I'm gonna think you mean one, and I'm gonna think you're pretty dumb, right? Like that's not the right way to do things. So this is an important point even though that's what you see in the paper, you will not say one to the power of 12. You will not write that down. You will put the times 10 back in and you will say one times 10 to the 12, right? I'm going to count on you guys to do that. I'm going to yell at you if you don't do it. Watch out. I could be mean. Okay. <clears throat> Let's do a little table of common powers of 10. And this will help you keep it straight when I talk about millions and billions and trillions and things, OK? I'm going to erase here, guys. I frequently am going to ask, can I erase? And if, if you're not done copying, you should shout at me. Just to clarify one more time, we sure. are writing 1 times 10 to the power of 12 stars, or whatever the unit is, yeah? Um, Nina, can you just rephrase it? Because I'm not sure if I understand the question. I'm just, just to clarify one more time, when we write down whatever answer it is, it's one times 10 to the power of 12 stars or whatever unit, correct? Exactly. Every now and then in this class, we'll have numbers that don't have units, but that's like 1% of the time or less. They almost always have units and I always want you to write them down. And I think if you get on my psychic wavelength, eventually you'll understand there are really good reasons for that. You will, you will like the, the way I do things if you trust me, okay? All right, um, let me do something else I think will be helpful. Let's make a quick little table together. By the way, I want to make a suggestion, another suggestion about this class. Um, 
One sec here. I would like you guys to get a couple of things. Hold on. Um, when you're out at Staples or Job Lot and you're buying your $8 Casio calculator, can I make a strong recommendation that will only cost a couple of extra dollars? It'll be really nice for the work we do in this class. Get yourself a little simple, clear plastic ruler, especially one that has centimeters on it. We don't want to work in inches. That's lame. We like centimeters in this class, right? Get a little clear plastic ruler, 50 cents. Um, if you've got an extra 50 cents, get a little protractor. I promise you this will be useful. 50 cents. You can use this in all kinds of classes. Hey, if you're really feeling crazy and you want to splurge, I went to the art store in, in Providence. I got myself a little cute circle maker. That's fun. We make circles in astronomy. If you want to really be a badass, if you really want to be a badass, get yourself a compass. I'm going to train you on how to use this compass eventually. It's not like you absolutely need it, but it would be pretty cool if you bought a compass. Some of them are cheap and chintzy and cost like a dollar. You can get them at BJ's. Those don't work so well. This one is like not the fanciest one, but it's a pretty respectable Stadler compass that I got at the art store. I use them all the time. These are tools. They're not very expensive. Get them. It's good for academic work. Get the ruler. Whatever you do, please get the calculator, OK? Um, what made me think of that is I'm about to do something you're going to see me do a lot, which is I like to make tables and charts to organize information. So let's go ahead and make a table. If you don't have a ruler, find something or freehand it, okay? And let's do like three columns. And we'll have a few rows here. I found this really helps students, okay? So this will be the name of our number. This will be 10 to the power of X. And over here, we're going to put the metric prefix. We're gonna be working in metric units for the most part in this class. You just learned about a trillion, which is 10 to the power of 12. <clears throat> what if we also do like billion, million and thousand. How many zeros in a billion? Nine. Very good. In a million? Six. Good. And of course, a thousand has? Three. Very good. Now, do you guys know the metric prefixes for these things? You might not even know what I mean by the metric prefix. The metric prefix by 4,000 is kilo. For instance, a kilometer is a thousand of these here meters. My board that I'm writing on is approximately one meter in, in length, okay, or in width rather and a length, it's kind of square. A kilometer, a kilometer is a thousand meters. What about for million? What's the metric prefix there? What comes after kilobytes? Geez, didn't you guys grow up on computers and the internet? I bet you guys have never even like seen the sun before or held a ball in your hand. You guys just grow up like looking at your phones. And you can't tell me what's after kilobytes? Megabytes or millibytes or something like that. Megabytes. So mega is the metric prefix for million. How about billion? You did so good, Whitney. Thanks. Um, all right. So kilo, mega, um, I don't know. Giga. Oh, close, close. 
And then for Trillion, damn, you guys are getting your money's worth this semester. Terra. The hard drive that I record these lectures on, that's a two terabyte hard drive. So that means there's two times 10 to the 12 bytes, whatever that is, all right? Bytes are little units of information. Keep that around. That might come in handy. Because this is a absolutely essential skill for our course, our first lab today is dedicated to practicing doing calculations in scientific notation and basically just to practice using your EXP key. Although the lab handout has instructions, I'm frequently going to go off road and use the lab handout in my own particular way. All you have to do is write down whatever I write down and then submit that and turn that in. That's something we should also have a discussion about. Um, in fact, that's the discussion I want to have next. Uh, we should take a little break. I should give you guys like a 15 minute break or so. I mean, we could power through, but I bet you guys could use a little mental pause. How do we feel about that? We feel good about that. It's really hard to listen to someone talk for multiple hours. So um, in the future, when we have USB drives connected to our skulls, I can just sort of download the information that way directly to your brains. But until such time, I don't know how else to communicate information except for talking. And that takes some time. Let's take a little break. But I want to say this. Um, if you're planning on doing the lab today, I'm probably going to use a pre-recorded lab because none of you have your calculators. But you might want to print out the lab sheets. And I was mentioning to, I think, Nina at the beginning of class today uh, that if you, if you go to the lab section, I've activated your first lab, which is powers of 10. And if you right click lab one powers of 10 PDF, um, this, this will come up. And probably in the pre-recorded lab, I'm only going to do like maybe this first page. I don't even think I'm going to get to the next two pages. So go ahead and just just download the very first or print rather print the first page. Alternatively, you might be able to type onto this using Acrobat Reader. Let me see how I would do that. But if you're going to type homeworks, this is really important class. You need to use an equation editor. And if you don't know what that means, then you are not allowed to type your homework. And I don't want to see it. For those of you who don't understand, let me demonstrate. If I see anyone submit a homework that looks like this, 1 times 10 carat 12 stars, I am going to lose my shit and I'm going to mark it all wrong, OK? The kind of shit that I want to see is the way I write it on the board. You go to your equation editor, insert, ooh, why is that blacked out? I think you have to, oh, it's because it's compatibility mode, file. OK, I see what's going on. Um, I downloaded this off the internet, so of course it's having a shit here. File, new, blank document. OK, good. So now if I go to insert equation, if you type that thing, it's one. You actually have to use the little symbols up here. Do you see this? Get out of my way. Uh, where's the times key? One times, insert the times. And look, there's a script here. Watch this. You make a little power of 10. Isn't that cute? 10 to the. If you're not willing to do this, then you are not allowed to type the homework. OK? That's how I want the math to look. I want it to look all fancy with division bars and things. You see what I'm saying? So you might be able to actually type your lab work today. Um, one way to do that, I think, is in Acrobat Reader, you can type some stuff up. but I don't want to get too into the mechanics of it. You know what I think most of you should do? Simplest, easiest, dumbest way to do this is honestly just to print it, OK? Print this first page to write on it with me, and then take a picture of it with your phone and submit that to Blackboard. Is that something you guys think you can do? If not, if you do not have a working printer, I need you to write the whole thing out by hand with the problems so that I can like follow as I go along and grade it. 
Sometimes that won't be hard, other times it will be. Let's take a little 20 minute pause. I kind of went past the tea break point there, but I was finishing a thought. Um, <clears throat> when we come back from our tea break, I'm gonna give you two more lessons on stuff that you need for your homework. I'll give you a couple of vocabulary terms and stuff. And then uh, we'll probably break for the day early, but you guys are responsible after today's lecture for lab one. I'm just not gonna do it because none of you have a calculator and that kind of spoils the whole point. That makes sense to everyone? Okay. So it's one, what is it cell phone time? It's 148 on my computer. It's one, yeah, something's weird. It's 156 on my iPhone. Is that what you guys have? So why don't like, we kind of have a lot to do today. So 215, let's just take a, normally I'll give you a little more time for tea break, but just take a short little break, get a drink of juice or something, look at the sun, and then we'll do a little more lecture and then we'll break, okay? All right. I'll see you guys in just a few. Okay, friends, we're back from tea break. I paused the recording so that I wouldn't waste the uh, digital space with dead air. Um, we're gonna do a couple of uh, modules and exercises that will train us for our homework session, which will start on Wednesday. I'm just going to keep reminding the class because I see people coming in and out that uh, today I'm giving you the pre recorded lab because most of you do not have the Casio calculator that I want you to train with for that lab. It doesn't take very long. It's like 50 minutes, uh, 50 minutes at best. Just a short exercise to make sure that you can punch the buttons that I want you to punch. Okay. Um, at the end of class, I'll find the link and I'll give it to you with the proper timestamp and I'll be sure to post that on Blackboard as well. Okay, so I need to talk to you guys a little bit about the orbit of Earth and seasons and I wanna to talk to you guys about angles if I can as well. Let's see if I can get all of that done. So I need a couple of basic vocabulary terms so that we can talk to each other. Uh, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hide the trolls. If you ain't sharing video, you're a troll. And I don't want to look at you in my recording. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let's take some notes on the orbit of Earth. Just some vocab stuff that we have to talk about. <clears throat> All right, so this section is called Earth's orbit. We're going to go over a couple of basic concepts. First thing uh, that I want to talk about, let's see if I can find my globe here. Um, here's Earth. Earth has an axis tilt, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, if I spin it counterclockwise as seen from the North Pole, that is the proper orientation for Earth's spin. Every day, Earth has a 24 hour axis spin, okay? So when I say axis spin, this is what I'm talking about. In addition, Earth is simultaneously going through its yearly orbit around the sun. And both of those motions combined are happening at the same time. Let's define them. So Earth has an axis spin. The axis spin gives rise to a day. And as you probably already know, one day is equal to 24 hours. I want you guys to put a box around that. Now, that's not supposed to be new information to you guys, but this is your first of one of many. This is what we call a conversion factor. And you're gonna be seeing a lot of conversion factors in our class. A conversion factor relates one set of units like days to another set of units like hours. The point is that you should write down my conversion factors with me so that you see what abbreviations I'm using for units and you're going to follow suit and do it just like I do. Okay. So we're starting off with stuff, you know, and then we're going to start getting into things you don't know. Um, when we talk about Earth's orbit about the sun, um, we can talk about um, the orbital revolution, that's gotta be a better way to say that. That's too wordy for me. Um, the orbit of Earth
around the sun takes place over one year. One year is approximately 365 days. In your next lecture, I'm gonna expand upon this conversion factor. I'm gonna talk a little bit about synodic years. And sorry, I'm gonna talk about tropical years versus sidereal years, but you're not ready for that just yet, excuse me. Um, in addition, Earth also has an axis tilt. The axis tilt of Earth is 23.5 degrees with respect to something called the ecliptic plane, okay? Let me show you guys a picture here. In my slideshow, I've got a couple of different pictures that, that sort of demonstrate what's going on. Let me jump ahead here. All right. Um, you know, an interesting idea, uh, something that, that happens, if you look at the if you look at the solar system from above, from the North Pole in space, you would notice if you could watch the in Earth spinning around Earth, that Earth's spinning counterclockwise on its axis, and it's also orbiting around the sun counterclockwise. And you're going to find that almost every body in our solar system does the same thing. All of the planets orbit counterclockwise in the same direction as the Earth. They also spin, for the most part, counterclockwise, with one or two painful exceptions. Now, there's a reason that all of these objects are spinning in the same direction. There's a reason that they're all orbiting around the sun in the same direction. It has something to do with the way our solar system formed in something called the nebular, hypo or the nebular theory. But I don't want to get into all that just yet. You have to earn that. So we're going to get there at some point. For now, it might be a good idea to think about the fact that we can actually define directions in space. So uh, from now on, anytime something is in the direction of Earth's North Pole, we're gonna call that North in space. Anytime something is in the direction of the South Pole, we'll call that South in space. And East and West are a little bit funky. Check out uh, beautiful America here. You guys know that the East Coast is over here and the west coast is over there. So this direction here on the globe is east. But something funny happens. If I spin 12 hours over here, narrowed island points over in this direction. How are we gonna define east in space when east is constantly moving? One way to think about east is that east is in the direction that Rhode Island is turning as it spins along with the turn of Earth. In other words, this sounds a little nutty at first. We can define counterclockwise as east in space. And the more you think about that, the more good judgment it makes. Think about watching uh, the Earth spin. Earth is spinning in the direction of east. It makes the sun rise in the east and set in the west, okay? So, <clears throat> If that didn't make any sense to you, then just write this down. In space, from now on, counterclockwise is equal to east. All right? And of course, the corollary to that is that Clockwise is west. Let's see if you all understood that. Let's test you. I'm going to show you a picture. What was that slide? Was it 56? Yeah, man, I'm good. What a great memory I've got. Okay. <clears throat> is Earth, as it orbits the sun, traveling eastward or westward around the sun? East. Good. What if you're at the perspective of Earth and you're watching the sun travel throughout the background constellations? 
like let's say you're worshiping your astrology signs or something. During the course of the year, does the sun make an eastward or a westward journey along the constellations of the zodiac? Look at the picture. Use what you've been taught. See if you can do something. Is the sun making an eastward or a westward journey along the constellations of the zodiac? East. Very good. Nina cannot be tricked. You're too good, Nina. Um, <clears throat> Nina can see that if the sun is in Pisces in March, and then over here in June goes from Pisces to Gemini, that the sun is moving counterclockwise against the constellations of the zodiac. And counterclockwise is the same as east. The sun travels east along the constellations of the zodiac, moving a little bit each day. Now, obvi, if you're standing on Earth, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. I ain't talking about that. That's the diurnal motion. That's the daily motion. The sun is making a secondary motion. And each day, it's drifting backwards a little tiny bit by technically four minutes. Astronomers have this funny joke. They say the sun rises four minutes each day. Uh, the sun rises four minutes early each day. Now, I'm not going to explain that funny joke to you. One, because it's not funny. And two, because it's deep and profound. And you have to think about what that means. If you want to press me for what that means, you can ask me in the next lecture. The sun rises four minutes early each day. I dare you to meditate on that for a couple of days. Okay, um, <clears throat> let's talk about the path that Earth makes around the sun. There's like a special magical name for that, and it's called the ecliptic, introducing a new $10 vocabulary word to really know that you're getting your money's worth, okay? Check out this picture here. The orbit of Earth around the sun, <clears throat> its eastward journey, travels a line that you can see here as a dark blue circle. It's wicked close to a perfect circle, but it is not a perfect circle. Let's pretend it's a circle for now. Um, this circle has a name, and the orbital path is called the ecliptic. But the ecliptic can be used in many different ways, which is why it's an important vocabulary term. I could talk about the ecliptic path, which is just the circular path of Earth around the sun. But I could also talk about the fact that, as I mentioned earlier in our class, the circular orbit of Earth doesn't change its orientation. Not much, anyways. All right, anyways, so the ecliptic plane is like a two-dimensional plane that's made by connecting the ecliptic to the sun. In fact, the ecliptic plane is kind of like the disk of the solar system, because you will discover that most of the other planets orbit the sun also within one or two degrees of the ecliptic plane. And once again, that's not random. That means something. The ecliptic can be used in a lot of different ways. It's a really important vocabulary term. I'm going to erase this little bit because I'm going to need some more board space here. You guys cool with that? Can I erase this? All right. Let's take some definitions down. Uh, there is the ecliptic. The ecliptic has two different definitions. The first is definition number one. Mm. OK. This is the simpler one. It is the path of Earth. around the sun. That's it. Keep it simple. However, there is another way to look at the ecliptic. What if instead of thinking about it from the solar system's perspective, what if you think about it from the Earth's perspective, like a person living on Earth, as you unfortunately do? If you're on Earth, you tend to orient it, gesundheit, so that the North Pole is up and the South Pole is down in your mind. And when that happens, the ecliptic can be thought of in a different way. Instead of the ecliptic being the path that Earth makes around the sun, related to this little funny joke I just told you, 
What if we thought of the ecliptic as being the path that the sun makes against the background stars? Now, like I said, you have to observe carefully to see that. But if you could watch the sun drift along the background stars, you would notice that night after night, the sun was making a little small four minute, one degree motion along the ecliptic. And that's a different way to look at the ecliptic that's radically different. Instead of it being the path of earth around the sun, it's now the path of the sun against the background stars or something like that. Let's try that one out. The ecliptic, definition number two, is the path of the sun against the background stars. And I'm talking about its yearly motion. Doesn't that path of the sun against the background stars remind you of something that we talked about before tea break? What's that remind us of? Astrology. Yeah. In fact, there was a better term, a name for those constellations that the sun drifts through. What was that? Whitney knew what it was. I thought you did anyways. Somebody did. What do we call those constellations? The fun time astrology constellations? What do we call them? The zodiac. The zodiac. And what I'm here to tell you today is the ecliptic is the zodiac and the zodiac is the ecliptic. You know, Jesus didn't paint a little magical beam across the sky so I could see where the ecliptic is. If I'm a real astronomer and I wanna know where is the plane of our solar system, I look for Gemini and uh, Pisces and Capricornus. They're useful. They're actually useful constellations. So the ecliptic is the zodiac. The path of the sun is the ecliptic and the sun travels through the zodiac constellations. You can see that in my little slideshow there, right? Look, the sun's drifting through Pisces, through Aries. Remember earlier when I showed uh, Whitney that the sun was in Aquarius on her birthday. That was pretty funny. That's what I was doing. I was pushing the sun along the ecliptic and each point on the ecliptic corresponds to a date, okay? Um, let's not remember or forget either that we can talk about the ecliptic plane. You're gonna hear me use that term sometimes. The ecliptic plane is the disk of the solar system. So you guys are learning all kinds of new useful things. Write all that down because I need to erase. All right, I'm erasing. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Um, before I do the next thing, the next thing is I want to talk about distances in our solar system. So let's have a quick discussion about metric units of distance, okay? Typically, we measure distances in the United States in really lame units like feet and miles. They call those imperial units or English units. And they are based on old archaic measurements like the width of a king's foot. They're also full of really confusing and shitty numbers that are hard to remember. Instead, our snobby European friends are using the more elegant metric system. And in the metric system, the standard unit of length is a meter. A meter is kind of like a yard, but better. As I mentioned before, my dry erase board here is approximately one meter in width. The typical human being, well, if I'm a typical human being, I don't know about that, but uh, is close to two meters tall, but not quite, right? Uh, 
I'm maybe 1.7 or 1.8 meters tall. People sometimes say the average human is about, oh shit, I never plugged this thing in. I can't believe this hasn't pooped on me yet. Hold on a second, guys. Wow. Oh my God, I can't believe I got away with it. You know, when I don't plug this thing in, it dies in the middle of class, which is a horrible situation. Because first of all, I have to figure out how to get back in touch with you and send you a new Zoom link. And second of all, it chops the recording in half, which is really, really bad for the processing later. So I just got the battery replaced in this thing and I'm, I'm really, I can't believe I made it two hours without it crapping out. That's amazing. Don't ever let me do that again, right? Okay, I knew I was forgetting something. Um, metric units of distance, I apologize. The meter is the gold standard. We're gonna be using meters in our, um, in our homeworks all the time. A meter is kind of like a yard, but better. That's how you should think about it. Abbreviation is 1M. Uh, some uh, meters are good for small scale things. Um, distance is comparable to the size of a human or the size of a room. When we want to measure distances on planets, so we're very frequently going to be concerned, as you will quickly discover, with the radii, the radius of planets and moons. The radius of a planet or a moon tells you a lot about it, actually. Um, and, and for that situation, we're going to want to use the kilometer. whose abbreviation is 1km. Based on our discussion of metric prefixes, how many meters do you think are in a kilometer? Consult the chart. A thousand? Yeah. Let's write that down. One kilometer is equal to a thousand meters, okay? That is a key conversion factor. In fact, put little stars next to it. You're going to use that conversion factor all the time. Uh, here are some things to think about. This is a little bit of an indulgence, but I feel like doing it. Let's think about the state of Rhode Island. I should memorize these numbers anyways. I think Rhode Island is like 80 kilometers by 60 kilometers if you think of it as a rectangle. <clears throat> let's see, let's see if I remember that correctly. I like how if we go to Wikipedia, they have like data here on the side. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> so uh, the length of Rhode Island is 77 kilometers. The width of Rhode Island is 60 kilometers. Let's write that down. So it's 60 kilometers in width and maybe 80 kilometers in length. Okay. If we want to measure distances in outer space, kilometers are still too clumsy a unit to use. Let's consider, for instance, the Earth and its orbit around the sun. I told you that the orbit of Earth is close to, but not exactly, a perfect circle. And that means that at key times of the year, Earth can get a little bit closer to the sun. We call that perihelion. Peri means next to, and helios means the sun. So perihelion is close to the sun. There's a point where Earth is a little bit farther from the sun because it's not a perfect circle. That's called aphelion. Those vocab terms are worth uh, writing down here, okay? So we have the vocabulary term perihelion, closest uh, point to the sun in orbit.
we also have the term aphelion farthest point from the sun in orbit. Uh, hopefully you guys can read that. My handwriting gets a bit messy when I when I write fast. Farthest point from the sun in orbit. Uh, thoughts. What time of year, if you had to guess, what month would you suppose perihelion occurs at, if you had to guess? July. What if I told you, Nina, that perihelion occurs in January? Oh, I would be wrong. Yeah, but that would seem kind of weird, wouldn't it, Nina? Yes. That perihelion's in January. Because you were probably thinking that it would be summertime when it was closest to the sun, right? It turns out that's not how it works, Nina. And we got to learn about seasons in just a moment, okay? So stay tuned to have yourself corrected. Okay. Um, I think aphelion occurs in July or maybe even in August. Actually, I think it's July. All right, put that aside for a second. Um, sometimes it's nice to talk about the average distance between the Earth and the sun. And that's going to be a key vocabulary term for us. It's a new unit. It's called an astronomical unit or 1AU. It is defined as the average distance between Earth and the sun, and it has a value of 150 million kilometers. We don't need miles, okay? That's people sometimes say 93 million miles. Let's write that down. I'm going to erase here. Introducing a new unit of distance, the astronomical unit, otherwise known as 1AU, okay? Um, 1AU is the average distance between Earth and the sun. One AU is 150 million kilometers. Okay, <clears throat> it's almost time for a kid's break here. From now on in this class, we have a rule, a rule that we will obey during homeworks and other situations. We don't have to do it during today's lab. Today's lab is special, but for all the times in this class, here's a rule. Any number that is greater than 1 million. How do I say 1 million in scientific notation? Consult your chart. N to the sixth. Any number that is greater than 10 to the power of six, or for those of you who don't speak math, any number that is greater than 1 million must be in scientific notation. I would like you guys to obey that rule going forward, okay? To help us with this, uh, Nina, is going to help us translate this into scientific notation. Do you think you're up to that challenge, Nina? Sure, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hesitantly, I'll I know, try. I know, I know everyone likes to be called on and volunteered for things, so That's I thought I'd, I'd give you that honor, Nina. Um, so if you want to start off slow, we could think about what's our lead digit. 15 or one. Right, because we can't have a lead digit that's bigger than nine, right? So our lead digit is one. So let's write, all right, so we're gonna write one AU. Uh, do you know what you do from here? Because 
I guess before, yeah, I see why you said 15, before we put all the zeros in, right? Nina, I'm, I'm realizing that I kind of did you guys a disservice. I forgot, after I did this, I meant to explain how to put a random number into scientific notation, but I had took tea break and I kind of forgot about it. So up here, let's say you had an annoying number like uh, 9876543211. Mm -hmm which uh, if I remember my number schools, that's, o that's okay, Kyle, we don't mind. Why don't you sh share video with us and show us that dog? We wanna see that pooch, okay? Help our dig go by here. Um, <clears throat> this would be, let's see, uh, thousands, millions, billions, nine trillion, wait, did I get this right? Sorry, hundreds, <laughs> thousands, Millions, billions. What the hell is wrong with me? Nine billion eight hundred and seventy-six million five hundred and forty-three thousand two hundred and ten. That's the number, right? That's an annoying number. It's a number greater than ten to the six. You take your leap digits nine, and you keep the rest of those numbers as change. Okay. So after the decimal point, you go eight seven six five four three two one. You don't need the zero, and then you do times ten. And you basically treat all the numbers after the lead digit as if they were zeros. So one way to think about it is the decimal point used to be here. You've moved it between the nine and the eight. You've therefore moved it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times. So I could write this number in scientific notation as 9.8765432.1 times 10 to the nine or 9.87 billion. Yeah. If you were a pesky student, a pesky student might say, bro, why did you bother doing that? That's even worse than this number. Fair, yes, pesky student. The problem is most of the time people aren't gonna actually keep all those digits of precision, especially not in astronomy. Usually you will just kind of round that number off and the way we're going to do it in this class is uh, during lab today, I will teach you about the art of rounding. But until you know how rounding works, assume that you're going to round to two digits, okay? So you'd round it to say 9.9 .9 times 10 to the 9. You guys know that rule, right? Like if you're going to chop the number there, if the number that you're cutting is five or more, you increment this. Please tell me you learned that at some point in like preschool or something, right? Okay. That in mind, Nina, could you help me now that I've done a better job explaining, help me put 150 million into scientific notation? Um, okay, can I, wait, can I ask a question real I guess quick? You, can. you just did. Go ahead, ask as many as you like. Um, so for the, the one, so for not including the five in the first digit, so it's just one, is, are we timesing? Mm, okay, I feel like I'm gonna sound stupid, but um, so it'd be like one times 50 or is it still 10? Okay, okay. Let's slow our roll down. Okay. The only point of, the only purpose for the power of 10 is to tell you how big the number is. The one and the five have to do with precision. Precision is okay. how carefully measured was my number. So okay. the way a scientist would look at it, um, Nina, is this part of the number is the, what we would call the precision. Mm -hmm. And this is the order of magnitude, okay? okay? Don't get your order of magnitude confused with your precision. The, the order of magnitude here is 100 million, okay? The one and the five have to do with precision. Normally you keep your first digit, you know that's one. Yeah. In proper form for scientific notation, you always put a decimal point after your lead digit. What numbers you keep afterwards depend upon the precision. Let's keep two sig figs. So what am I gonna write next? 1.5. And then we're gonna do times 10. Times 10 to the seventh. Count better. 
I agree that there are seven zeros, but remember, we have to treat the numbers that are not part of the lead digit as zeros too, right? In other well, words, you agree with me, Nina, yeah. that the decimal place ends up between the one and the five, correct? But the decimal place used to be over here, correct? So let's count better. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and the five is treated as an eight, okay? Okay. This version, Nina, yes. that's what we would call proper form for scientific notation. In proper form, you have a number with a decimal point and some change times, like here, let me show you proper form. It's a, des, uh, a lead digit followed by some more numbers times 10 to this, okay? Normally, when you look up conversion factors in the book and other places, they tend to use proper form of scientific notation. Okay. For instance, a useful appendix in the book that you're gonna make use of from time to time is, is one called Astronomical Distances in Appendix A. And oh, I need to adjust my focus here. Focus, focus, focus. Let's see if I got that. What the hell is that? Normally, if I go to a focus of 30, this thing goes right there. There is something real weird. I think they must have changed the pre. Ooh. Wow, it's just so persnickety. Okay. Look, do you see how they've used proper form here? Notice that they have 1 AU is actually 1.496 times 10 to the 8 kilometers. It's a lead digit followed by some change times 10, right? You see that? Sometimes, Nina, it's useful to use improper form. For instance, let's say we did what you were about to do earlier. Earlier, you were going to say 15 times 10 to the 7. That would actually be OK, OK? That's, that's OK. If I wanted to, I could write 1 AU equals 15 times 10 to the 7. That's weird, but it's okay. It's valid. Because you have a 15 with seven zeros after it. Now, personally, I'm so weird that I write it really strange. I actually go one step back and I leave my decimal point back here. Watch how messed up I am. When I write one AU, I like to write one AU is equal to 150 times 10 to the 6 kilometers. And this, my friends, that's what you call good math style, OK? Why would I do such a thing? Why would I like to jimmy my decimal point around so that my power was 10 to the 6? Ah, because remember, do you remember that chart that I made you earlier? 10 to the 6 is equal to what? Million, no, billion, no, million. Million. So Nina, when I look at math, I speak math so fluently that I'm translating it into my mind. One AU is equal to 150 million kilometers. So you'll often see me wiggle around the decimal place so I can jiggle my zeros into millions, billions, and trillions because then it flows off your mind. I don't know if that makes any sense or not. But you now I think saying 150 million kilometers is more elegant than saying 1.500 thousand kilometers, right? That's a little more lame. Anyways, you can actually plug all of these into your calculators using your, wait for it, the EXP key. Let me see if I can find the magical focus that will work for this here. There we go. So I could put in 1.5 EXP8. Whoop. Notice if I hit equals, it just comes right out. No times 10, just EXP. I could do 15 EXP7. Equals, whoop, same thing. 
or my personal favorite, I like to do 150 EXP6. You can actually just leave it like that, but if I think it goes to print it out. Oh my gosh, apologies. <clears throat> I was not, I was, my schedule has not yet conformed to this summer too. I wonder if you guys are going through the same thing. Hopefully we'll get more in sync as we go. Um, this is how you're gonna see me writing 1AU. What is the purpose of 1AU? The purpose of 1AU is to serve as a new meter stick that we can use to measure distances in our solar system. So let me show you some pics to help you understand. Um, um, question, yeah, talk to me. Okay. Um, on any homeworks or lab, do you want us to write in proper form or improper or math? Hey, what's that pooch's name, Nina? Uh, her name is Comrade. Comrade. Comrade, yeah. you will be our comrade through the solar system. We're going to work. He's just sitting there checking out the show. I love it. I love it. Two for one deal. Okay. Uh, comrade is pretty cool. We'll have to see more of Comrade. Um, so uh, that's a great question, Nina. We will, we will usually use improper form and we'll use crazy maths for most of this. The one exception is today's lab, which unfortunately I'm not gonna do with you because no one has the calculator. Today's lab is not long, I don't stretch it out. It's just, I want today's lab to be you guys practicing five or six times putting numbers into proper form. So when you watch the video, you'll watch past me explain exactly what to do. I'll, I'll tell you what to do and exactly what to write down. There'll be no confusion at all. But I just wanna tell you that for today's lab, you're gonna end up using proper form, but after that, anything goes, okay? So I figured we should do it once in proper form just to make sure you, believe it or not, there are still some, do you see how Nina kind of knew scientific notation, but she had to stumble around a little bit? All of us need to practice that, okay, in order to get smooth. And, and that means you're learning, that's a good thing. Um, let's talk about what an AU really is. Okay, it's 150 million kilometers. But what we do is we use an astronomical unit as a measuring device to measure distances from the sun to the other planets. Now, I wanna make a note to self here. Every time I see a number that is between zero and one, like see how Venus is 0.7 AU? I read that in my mind as 70% of an AU. So I always think of numbers between zero and one as a percentage. And I hope with time you will too. So from the sun to Mercury is 40% of an AU. From the sun to Venus is 70% of an AU. Obviously Earth is one AU by definition. If you measure the distance to Mars, Mars is 1.5 AU from the sun, okay? Now, things get really interesting in the outer solar system. There are these vast distances. To get to Jupiter, it's five AU. To get to Saturn, 10 AU, so that's twice the distance. To go from the sun to Uranus, 20 AU. Um, Neptune is 30 AU from the sun. Now, Pluto's orbit, as I mentioned earlier in class, is highly squashed. It comes interior to the orbit of Neptune. But if you measure the longest and the shortest extent and take the average, the average distance between Pluto and the sun is about 40 AU. That also means, think about it, if the radius of the solar system is maybe 40 or 50 AU, the entire solar system edge to edge is like 100 astronomical units or so. Mm. As you can see from this previous diagram, that's still a little bit of a lie. Love lying to my students. They don't know any difference. Why not? I still get paid the same. Anyways, look, check it out. If you check out the distances, the sun to like the very edge of what we call the heliopause, that's the edge of the sun's magnetic boundary, that's maybe 100 AU. Um, there's a reservoir of comets called the Oort cloud. They can orbit like anywhere from 1,000 to 100,000 AU. By the time you start going to nearby stars, you stop using astronomical units and you usually switch over to light years. Alpha Centauri is four light years away, but it's like, I don't know, 400,000 astronomical units or something. Anyways, there's a, the, there's a lot to the solar system, but the idea is that if you're using astronomical units, most distances in the solar system are a number between one and 100, and those are easy to memorize. That's why it's useful. 
So you're going to see us using astronomical units all the time. Okay, there were a bunch of other modules that I wanted to do before we end today. I can see that I'm going to fail. I did not move quick enough. I'm sorry. There is one last lesson for me to teach you that is really important, not for today's lab, uh, but for the homework. So uh, let's just take a show of hands. How many of you think that you will... I have pre-recordings of the homework that I can show you, but how many of you would like to do it live Wednesday, 10 a.m. to 12? I don't want to wake up early unless you guys want to do this. Nina's in, Whitney's in, Joey's in. Okay, so for this first week, even if it's just three of you, we'll try it, okay? We'll... It might be 10, 15. I'm just, you know, I went into astronomy for a reason, guys. Mornings are not my forte. Astronomers stay up all night. But I will, I will do my damnedest, okay? So 10 or 10, 15, we'll crank out that homework together. Um, if you guys continue to appreciate that, then we'll do it. I do have pre-recordings for all of these if you want to. In any case, we need one, we absolutely need one more skill set before we can do that homework together. So let me teach you one last lesson and then we'll break for the day. What I would like to hope would happen is you guys will pause, go to Staples, get a calculator, and you'll come back and you'll do the lab tonight. Can I trust you to do that? Do you promise you won't screw that up and you won't get distracted and forget? I don't want to start this semester off bad. After, when, right before class ends, I'm going to show you how I want you to submit things, okay? And for the most part, like you'll see, if you watch that first lab video, it'll probably have me talking to the students from the previous semester, here's how you submit things. It'll probably go on and on. You're going to want to stop at some point, okay? So anyways, uh, for now, let me teach you one last lesson that you need to know. Okay. The next lesson, and this is probably the most important thing I'm ever going to teach you all semester. It's a technique for solving math problems that is going to make you powerful. Up to now, you've been wimpy, and math problems have bamboozled you and confused you. But it's because you didn't know this little tiny secret that's such a big deal. Lesson number two. something called dimensional analysis. Dimensional analysis is how we solve math problems in this class. In particular, it's how we solve something called conversion problems. Conversion problems are when you have to convert one set of units, like astronomical units, into another set of units, like kilometers. Let's make a concrete example here. This is the kind of thing that you're going to see in your homeworks and most definitely on your test. So you must be trained on this. If Pluto is 40 AU, from the sun, how many kilometers is that? All right. <clears throat> this is not a hard problem, believe it or not. This is actually about as easy as it gets, but I'm guessing that some of you might still be scared, okay? First of all, just so I can see what the abilities of my students are, because remember guys, I don't know you any more than you know me. I don't know what you know, and I don't know what you don't know. And I got to try to figure that out so I can dial this class the right way. Does anyone know how to solve that problem without my bullshit? Like if you just had to solve it right now and that was a test, could anyone actually do it? And if so, what would you do? Would you do uh, 15 times 40? Uh, not 15. You're on the right track, Whitney, but why 15? Oh, uh, oh, wait, I forgot. Hold on. I don't know. I think you had a good idea there, but you dropped a few okay. million zeros. Oh, wait, I don't even know why. I, oh, if one AU equals 150? 150, you kind of forget. Oh, something. Uh, 
150 trillion uh, million kilometers. Right, 150 million kilometers. So in that case, what would you do then, Whitney? I like your moxie. Well, if we're, it's 40 AU, so we have to make that 40 times. Look at that. Whitney's having a good day. You know, some days you have a good day like Whitney, and you just kind of see what to do, and you do it, and you win. And I hope many of those days follow you, Whitney. The reality is you're not going to have too many of those days in this class. Shit's just going to get weirder and weirder and harder to think your way through like that. Even though Whitney's method works, there's a better method that works every time. And here's the best part. You can just switch your brain off. You don't have to do anything. You just follow the little rules and put it into the machine and it all comes out perfect every time. I use it, you're gonna use it. Let's try it a different way, Whitney. Let's try it using the four steps of dimensional analysis. Now I want you guys to write this down with me, okay? And then I'll show you how it works. Put a big box, all right? And your page, because we're going to want to come back to this many times. If you're watching at home later on tonight, you better write this down in your stupid little notebook, too. It's called the four steps of dimensional analysis. And I'm putting it all in caps. I'm even going to put some stars next to it. And I think I'm even going to put some fire beams coming off of it because it's just that important. Okay. Later on, when you screw up, I'm going to ask you to read these four steps. Okay. Okay. Let's write down the steps. Step one is to write down the number to convert. with its units. I'm gonna have you just write the steps because we're kind of running out of time and then I'm gonna show you how it works. Step two is you multiply by a division bar. Okay, that's the easiest step. Step three is the key step. We are going to put the units in first such that they cancel each other out. And then step four, kind of running out of space here. We put the numbers in second. You guys even read this? Put the numbers in second using, uh, sorry, my handwriting is not good at the bottom here, using conversion factors. Uh, can't do this, hold on. Okay, just please write all that down. I'm not proceeding until you write all of it down. Okay, before we end, Whitney, you're gonna demonstrate to the class how to do this, okay? And I want you to go through the steps with me and we're gonna do exactly what we're supposed to do. So up here, I'll solve the problem. <clears throat> There's your question. Whitney, what's the first step? Oh, um, write down the number to convert with its units. 
So what number should I write down? Uh, 40 million. 40 million? Where do you see 40 million? Oh, um, 40 AU. Yeah. Sometimes knowing how to start can be confusing, Whitney. Yeah. You notice that I asked you to take 40 AU and convert that to kilometers. This is what we're trying to convert. Okay. It is not always easy to know what is trying to, sometimes step one is tricky. All right. So we write down 40 with its units, AU. What is step two, Whitney? Multiply by a division bar. We're always going to do that in the same way. We do a times and we put a division bar after. That's going to keep our options open. Sometimes multiplication is needed. Sometimes division is needed. We kind of want to be non-committal just yet, all right? Okay. Step three is the key step. What do we do there? Put the units in first to cancel out. Okay, what does that mean? Now, you guys know that, or you might remember from math class, there's a top of a fraction, that's the numerator, and that's the bottom of the fraction. But you see how 40 AU seems to kind of be in the middle of the line? That is an illusion. If you are a number, you are always in the numerator of a secret fraction, unless you are explicitly in the denominator. Because I could, if I wanted to represent this, is 40 AU divided by one. So what I'm trying to tell you is even though 40 AU is kind of in the middle of the line, AUs and 40 are currently on the top of the fraction. You're always in the numerator unless you're explicitly in the denominator. And what that means is I can cancel out astronomical units. Notice I'm not gonna touch any numbers. If I then put astronomical units on the bottom down here, the AUs, uh, the TI-84 plus, Kyle, is not a great calculator to use because it's a bazooka. Now, I know how to use a TI-84 or a T, sorry, I'm just, by the way, I'm responding to the ch Kyle on the chat. I don't think he has a something wrong with his audio or something. I got myself a TI-85. I had this since I was in high school years and years ago. Um, this is like a bazooka calculator, and it's just not necessary for our class. Now, Kyle, if you have one of these, it means that at some point you took a class that did some pretty intense math stuff. But it doesn't do you any good if you're going to get lost every time I do instructions. Let me ask you something, Kyle. Do you know how to take a fourth root on this thing? Yes or no? If I asked you to take, all right, his answer was no. So Kyle, this is not a good calculator for you to use. A good calculator for you to use, a good calculator for everyone to use is the Casio FX260 Solar, just this one. And it's gonna make things much better. It's only eight bucks, Kyle. That's less than the price of a pack of smokes, okay? You can do it. Um, <clears throat> anyways, back to our story. AU were on the top. Remember step three is put the units in first to cancel out. The first unit I put in is the AUs, and that means AUs on the top will cancel out with AUs on the bottom. I wanna go from AUs to kilometers, so I put kilometers on the top. That is step three, that is the secret. Notice I haven't touched any numbers, just units. Okay, step four, Whitney, hit me one time. Put the numbers in second using conversion factors. This is going to require us to find somewhere a conversion factor between AUs and kilometers. Where would we find such a thing? In our notes. That's right, because I'm the best. So what's the conversion factor? 150 million. Uh -uh, that's not how we talk. This is how you say a conversion factor. I want something on the left and I want something on the right. We say our conversion factor is 1 AU equals 1.5 times 10 to the eighth. Um, I prefer to use the good style version. 1 AU is 150 million kilometers, okay? That's the one I'm gonna use. Okay. Oh, yeah, this the is, other one. I forgot, I highlighted in, that. That's okay. In order to do step four, you need to have this thing tucked away in your notes somewhere, which you will. Here's the trick. Make sure that you keep the number with the units when you put them in. So we're gonna to wanna to keep 150 million next to the kilometers and one next to AU. Okay, 
So Whitney, tell me what to write on the top and tell me what to write on the bottom. Um, on the top, write the 150 times 10 to the six power. That's kilometers. And in the bottom? 40. Wait, does 150 million kilometers equal 40 AU? Oh, sorry. This, this is your conversion factor here, right? That's how this works. That's your conversion factor. How many AUs does 150 million kilometers equal? One. That's what you write on the bottom. See what I mean? Keep the number next to the units. Okay. Now what you do is you do whatever it tells you to do. If it's on the top, you multiply. It's on the bottom, you divide. You don't really need to divide by one. This is telling me basically what Whitney said a long time ago. 40 AU times 150 equals. Now, none of you have calculators yet. Okay. I kind of forgive you. Let's do it together. 40 times, watch how I punch this in. 150 EXP6. And then I just hit equals. Boom. Okay, what is this number? Let me see if I can get into focus here because you guys don't have a calculator. What's that number? 600 million. No, count better. Oh. Seven. Oh, um, six trillion. Nope. Oh. Say it better. I don't know. Trillion is 12 zeros. You do not have 12 zeros. Put your 60 million. No, this, was, this is billion. Say that. Giga. Giga. Oh, you want to get crazy like that? We can talk about that. Could you just put it? Is the number bigger than a million? Yeah. Give it to me in scientific notation. Oh, oh yeah, I forgot. Um, 600. Oh, oh. Um, Six times 10. And six times 10. Um, Count to the, the zeros. To the ninth. Mm -hmm. To the ninth. Jeez Louise. Okay. Well, you know what? No, I shouldn't. That was rude of me. Listen. You guys are learning. That's why you took this class. You know what this means? This means I have something to teach you, and that's good. All right, so watch how I write this down. Six times 10 to the nine. What are my units? Kilometer. Yeah, because kilometers are all that's left. Oh, yeah. Now, let's say you wanted to say it the other ways, right? That's six billion kilometers. Now let's say you wanted to, uh, okay. You already have kilometers, so you can't use giga for billion. Billion thousand is actually six terameters. So if you wanted to do that in metrics with the prefixes, I believe it would actually be TM. I think that's that's how you do terameters. It's terameters. Did I get that right? Yeah. Yeah, capital T. So there's terahertz. Okay, wow. I'm a cool guy. All right. Listen. Oh, by the way, when you're done, you box your answer because that's a classy move. And that's how I want to see our homeworks being done. All right. Listen, I'm going to give it to you straight. Two or three of the homework problems, we didn't quite cover the thing on angles that I needed to get to. And that's because I was slow. I'm sorry. I'll make it up to you next time. We'll squeeze it in there. Um, this is going to be the end of our class today. I went a few minutes over and I'm really sorry for this. The first couple of classes are a bit awkward because I just need to jam so much in just to kind of get us going. Like today I had to talk about the rules of the class and I kind of doinked around with you on the astrology thing. That was an indulgence, but I hate astrology. And if that's the only thing you remember from this class, that would be pretty cool. If you end up dropping tomorrow, I still want you to know astrology sucks. Okay. So... <laughs> That was me just, you know, fighting for the good. Now, listen, um, 
here's how this is going to work. I'm about to end class and disappear. You are still on the hook for today's lab. Let's go and find it together. I'll give you the link and I'm going to also post it in the Blackboard. Okay, so I'll be posting this video later to Blackboard and then I'll have another video. It'll be a YouTube link. There'll be another video below it saying, and this is your lab. But what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to go to one of the older, the classes I did last semester and take that lab. Let me, this is actually kind of helpful too. So let's go to Blackboard for a second and let's see how I'm going to do this. Actually, when I set up this class on Sunday, in the announcements section, this is where I will post both the Zoom links and I will also post the lectures. You can see that if you go back, I actually dragged lecture zero and lecture one, lab one from last semester up to the top. After, oh, I also dragged lecture one, homework one. After that, uh, they're all kind of upside down because I didn't take the time to drag them all into the correct order. Not only do I have spring 2021's class here, but I also have the class before that from last fall, if you go back even further. So I have two semesters of lectures here. So you don't need to do anything with this. Most of the time I will post it here each day. What I'm gonna do is when I'm done with this, I'm gonna delete live Zoom link and I'm gonna have lecture one, lab one. Okay, keep in mind that last semester, um, we didn't have to do a three hour lecture. We just, we did two lectures a week, an hour and a half each. So here's lecture zero. You've already had that. You don't need to watch this. Here's lecture one, lab one. And let's hope the lab came out good that semester. I can't always remember. I'm going to put this in the chat log in a second. So here's me talking and doing my shtick, which is probably very similar to the one that you guys got today with a whole bunch of kids last semester. And it looks like I started the lab. I sure hope I got to the end of the bloody thing. The lab should only be about an hour long. Uh, yeah, and, and I'm basically just going to talk a little bit more about scientific notation. What you're going to do is you're going to do the problems that I do with me, and you're going to submit them. And at the end of this lab, I'll even show you how to submit them. This is, this is a wicked long video because it has the lecture in it too, okay? I'm going to teach you all about sig figs. It looks like it starts there. That's timestamp 133.38. Let's just let that load, make sure I got that right. Go over here to my phone. Uh, I hope there's not a ton of doinking around here. There we go. All right. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, this is bad class. I'm glad that I didn't use this one. I'm sorry. This is, <laughs> this day, I remember what happened now. I forgot to hit, I hit pause between lecture and lab and I forgot to unpause it. So I don't want you to use this one. This one's bad. Uh, wow, that sucks. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Oh, never mind. Wait a sec. Yeah, I'm sorry. Let's do it from the previous semester, or I'll give you one from my, my 1020 class does a similar lab. Either way, we'll figure this out. This is lecture one, lab one. Let me click on that one instead. This one should be a little better. Yes. Um, I know it was annoying watching me look this up, but like I said, I would have been happy to do this with you if we had calculators, but you're really going to miss out. That looks like the right timestamp. Now, uh, before we go here, you guys might also have questions about how to submit. All right. I'm sitting down, this is good. So this is timestamp 138.13, good. 
let's get that one copy chat okay lab one is here and timestamp is roughly 138 to 13. When you, okay, does that make sense to everyone? What I just did there? All right. I will probably explain at the end of that lab how to submit the work, but just in case I didn't, or I don't know what's gonna happen, what you should do is take a picture of the worksheet with your phone. You could try to do it digitally too by like writing onto the PDF, but take a picture with your phone then you go to Blackboard. You guys probably already know this stuff from taking other classes, but I'm just gonna pretend like you don't know anything. Uh, you go to Lab, you go to Lab 1, and then when you see it, you're just gonna browse local files and upload your picture. I will only accept things that I can see, a .jpeg, a dot PDF, a dot text if you really have to, or a dot document. But I don't want to see any zip links or anything. Could you please just look at it and make sure that it looks normal in the preview box? How many of you have done this before? I just don't know what I'm dealing with here. Okay. Nicole, you have not done this, nor have you, Whitney? Oh, okay, Whitney hasn't. Here's the thing. I discovered something last semester. When people uploaded it from their phone, it tended to get all effed up. Could you do me a favor and take the extra second, send the picture from your phone to your email, take it to your computer, and then upload it from your computer browser? Is that something you guys could do for me? You'll know you did it right when you can see your homework in the preview box. And for the love of God, could you please make it upright? Literally, some people last semester would like submit shit to me sideways. Like, don't do me that like that, you know, like be cool to your poor professor who has to read all this stuff. Okay. Um, I'm going to also explain at the end of that lab. So I don't want to waste any more of your damn time. I got to stop this video. Do you guys have any questions for me or did I kind of cover it all proper here? Um, I just had a quick question. Uh, so the things that are due this week are the lab and the homework. Wait, let's be careful. Today, lab one is being assigned and you're responsible for that now. Okay. On Wednesday, when we meet again, we're gonna do homework one, 10 to 12. Uh -huh. Then we're gonna have lecture, 12 to three. Then we're gonna do lab two. Okay. Because remember, the way to think about this, Nina, is each class, we do a homework and we do a lab. But we didn't do a homework this class because you haven't learned anything yet. So you know what I mean? So this is going to be a weird week where you're going to have two labs due, but only one homework. In okay. general, each week you have two labs and two homeworks. Now, oh. ideally, I'd like you guys to submit it tonight. But here's the truth. I'm not going to grade it tonight because I'm cooked, okay? And I probably should give people watching the video a couple extra days of wiggle room. So I decided that I grade on Sunday nights, the whole week's worth of work for both of my classes. But I know some of you like to use Sunday night to get your homework done, because that's like a little break in your schedules. So I'm gonna give you until 11 p.m. on Sunday night. And then sometime after 11, I'll grade the papers and I'll deactivate the submission. Do you okay. guys think that's a good enough time for you? I mean, I gotta call it at some point, right? So yeah. is, till Sunday, enough time. Remember, all you've got to do is watch the video and I'm going to do everything with you. You don't even have to think. You just have to copy. Literally, just copy me. I actually think you can learn a lot by copying, okay? Um, so it's not stressful. You just have to make, you just have to carve out that time. You guys think you could handle that? All right. If so it's, it's not working. Sorry. Uh, I didn't you. No, talk. Two labs for this week. Two labs, one homework. We should get it ideally done before Sunday, but it's due Sunday, right? Yeah, that's like the point of no return. That's if, basically, what does it matter when you submit it? I'm not gonna grade it until Sunday, so you have until then. But yes. I think for you guys, what I think, so I've been doing this class longer than you've been taking it. And what I discovered works for you guys on your end is if you put it into manageable bits. 
like let's say we have this lecture today. You should probably do the lab and if there was a homework, do it before Wednesday, just because it's good for you. And then Wednesday, Thursday, maybe you do the next one. And then if something got screwy in your life, you have a couple of backup days, you know? The, the only thing that works, look, I'm telling you, I'm not really good at a lot of things in my life. And I don't even know if I was that good at college, but I started to learn the secret to doing college is just to have like a brutal routine. The only reason that my professor thing doesn't fall apart is because I just have these rigid routines. I'm always blocking out Monday for your class. I'm always blocking out Wednesday for your class. And I'm always blocking out Sunday night for my grading. And as long as I kind of stick to that, it kind of works. So try to find some routine until this madness is over, okay? Those are just tips for life, okay. Thanks for putting up with me. I know it's a long day. I, I really respect and appreciate what you guys do sitting here, okay? So you guys are gonna try to get that lab done. See if you could do it today or tomorrow, okay? You know why? Because tomorrow, uh, Wednesday's class, I'm gonna start using that technique. So this is, it's kind of really critical that you train on it. Please go get those calculators. If you ever have troubles, don't feel uh, worried about it. Text me, call me, email me. I don't care. I answer phone calls and emails from people all day long. Sometimes texting, calling is even better because I'll be on my bike or something and I can occasionally forget to respond to emails. So make use of, of me while, while I'm available. All right. All right, guys, um, you have the link. I'll be posting, uh, I'll be posting all of that uh, to Blackboard ASAP. Okay, guys, take care. I guess I'll send out a link around 10 a.m., around 10 a.m.-ish, okay, on Wednesday. Does that sound like a plan? If you can't make the homework session, come to the lecture and watch it later, but let's try to I, if I go through the trouble of redoing this, there's a video for that. I will redo it with you so that we can have that experience. But at least if Nina and Joey and Whitney show up, that would be cool. Okay. All right, guys. Until Wednesday, take care, space fans, wherever you are. Bye.